Greetings, humans. You have entered the Command Zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. How's it, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Command Zone podcast. I'm your host, Josh Lee Kwai. And I'm Rachel Weeks. I'm excited to be back. Rachel is back. She is uh, helping us out with all the Dominaria United stuff. And we are on, we're done talking about commanders, Rachel. Oh my God. There are so many commanders, 80 something or whatever. And now we're going to be talking about the cards that can go in your 99 that are non-legendary creatures, basically. Or I guess non-planeswalkers that don't have the claws. You know what I mean, everybody. That are going in the deck. And there's some really exciting ones that are that are just in the set that I think people are excited to add to their decks. I definitely am. Yeah, definitely some very cool stuff. And we're really we're not gonna talk about every card, obviously, that could go in the 99 from the set. We're just gonna kind of do the highlights. The stuff we think uh, we'll probably see some play in the format and isn't obvious. Like, Yeah, I mean, it's definitely the stuff that you need to be familiar with because it's going to be across the table from you is is our expectation of those cards anyway. Yeah, and we're not necessarily going to go into like the tribal lords, right? Like if you have a merfolk deck, play the tribal one, but you don't need us to tell you that. Yeah. Before we get into it, though, we got to talk about our sponsors, channelfireball.com slash command. That is the best place to go to buy your magic product, singles, anything at all. The Channel Fireball Marketplace has all licensed businesses as vendors on there. So you know you're de- dealing with LGSs. You can get bundles, collector's boosters, draft boosters, anything you need from Dominaria United. You can get it right now. Warhammer 40k. Coming out fast. Yep, it's right around the corner. In fact, I think at the time you're hearing this, we've already revealed uh, one of the pre-con decks. I think all the pre-con decks for 40k have been revealed. So yeah. you can probably pre-order those or, or else very soon. Again, channelfireball.com slash command. Or you can use the code command at checkout if you forget to put in the url which is something i still do every single time Mm -hmm. Uh, and then of course once you get your hands on the cards you want to protect them you want to keep them in really good condition the game accessories brand that jimmy and i trust our own collections to is ultra pro they really do make the best stuff to protect all of your game pieces they make awesome sleeves they have eclipse sleeves they have theme sleeves they get the uh licensing agreements with wizards of the coast so they often have like the guild symbols on the back, or the newest commander product, commander. Like if you want Dehada, if you want to build a Dehada deck, like uh, like Wait, you saw Rachel play on game nights, yeah. <laughs> then you can find Dehada sleeves, Dehada Dehada uh, playmat, Dehada deck boxes, um, all through Ultra Pro, and we do have an affiliate link with them as well. It's ultrapro.com/command. That is kind of a new thing. They haven't been direct to consumer for very long, um, which is cool because you can go on their site and get really big discounts. Ultrapro.com slash command if you want to get some good sales going. And of course, just buying Ultra Pro products at your LGS uh, is another way to support our show or, and all of our content. And then finally, the final way to support all of our content is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone. All kinds of cool perks. Um, on our Patreon. One of the best ones is that you get to see game nights and extra turns earlier than the general public. Mm -hmm. And also we do have some exclusive content that is only available on Patreon. Uh, We have a series called Turn Talk. You've been on it, Rachel. I love it. Yeah, which is just a, a quick conversation from the players of every extra turn episode after the game. So we, we play the game and then we sit down with everything and we talk and we say, how did your deck perform? What mistakes did you maybe make? Mm-hmm. The mistakes question I really love because I, I learned a lot. Just thinking about what my, my, my mistakes were and also what, you know, hearing from the other players about their, like yeah. what they thought were mistakes. It's so fun. And the, the other thing I really like about it is if there's a super cool interaction in your deck that you didn't get to in the game, you can be like, there's something cool though when I want to talk about it. So you do get to show off a little bit even if the deck didn't quite get there. Yeah, that's awesome. This was about to happen. Yeah. Uh, if you want to check that out, Patreon.com slash command zone is the place to go to support our content and watch all that stuff and check it out. All right. Uh, Oh, one other perk for patrons is that we shout out one lucky patron every single episode. And this episode is dedicated to Wes Wes Ziegler. Ziegler. Thank you. You rock. All right. I'm throwing that poster away because that's what had Wes's name on it. (laughs) And we just said it now, so it doesn't need to sit there staring at me. Okay. (laughs) In the 99 cards for Dominaria United, again, we're not going to go every, over every card, just the ones we think are going to make like sort of a splash in the format. Yeah, the the ones that you're going to look at first or maybe the ones you've already put into your decks. Yep, so we're going to skip like the tribal lords. We'll probably put them on screen real quick here, but if you're playing an elf deck, play the elf lord. It's really good. Anything that's kind of obvious, we probably won't talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a couple of cycles as well, the cycle of tribal lords. There is one cycle that we do need to talk about, though. We do. Um, this one's huge, and it's been much covered but we need to cover it because it's the Defiler cycle. Uh, so this introduces like Phyrexian mana to every 
card, kind of? Every permanent card. Yeah, it, it, it definitely, like, every color has a monocolored defiler. Yeah. And what it has is they all have the same first ability and then a different second ability. Mm. And the first ability basically allows you to pay two life instead of one of the colored pips in a permanent spell. Uh, right. Whatever the color is, like, you know, there's a green one. It, it allows you to pay two life instead of one of the green pips in a permanent spell. Um, and this is really cool because we usually when we see cost reduction on spells, it's the colorless mana reduction. Um, so seeing colored mana reduction is actually very powerful and pretty special to this cycle. Like we like to say on the show, cheating of mana cost is one of the most powerful things you can do in very magic. Good. Interestingly, before we get into each of these individually, you can only reduce the cost of a spell by the one color pip per defiler you've got. Yeah. So you cannot, let's say a spell costs three green, 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 and you have a defiler out, you can't pay six mana and reduce it by the six green. You can only pay two and reduce it by one of the green. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you had multiple green defilers, I suppose, in which case you could do it twice or maybe three times. And uh, notably, it only reduces the casting cost of permanent spells. It's not interested in instants and sorceries. It's enchantments. It's, uh, you know. Planeswalkers, creatures. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Let's look at the first one here, which is Defiler of Vigor, which is the green one. Yes. Do you want to read it? I do. So it's three green green for a 6-6 six, six with trample. It says, as an additional cost to cast a green permanent spell, you may pay two life. Those spells cost green less to cast if you paid life this way. This effect only reduces the amount of green mana you pay. So that's going to be on every Defiler uh, with their respective color. It says, whenever you cast a green permanent spell, you put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control. So that's the second ability, and those abilities will be different for each defiler. So the yeah. green one re does the Phyrexian mana cost reduction thing, but then when you cast a green permanent spell, it puts a 1-1 counter on each creature you control. That would be... It's very explosive. Yeah, I mean, that's just like a good ability to have on a yeah. creature, even if it didn't have the cost reduction thing. If it said every time you cast a creature, you put a plus one counter on each one of your creatures, you'd run that card. Yeah. Uh, but it's also reducing the casting cost of the creatures that you're casting, uh, which is a pretty big deal. And also, it's just green permanent spells, not even when you cast a creature. Yeah. So even your enchantments, if they have green in them, will put one one counters on all of your on creatures. All your stuff. Yeah. Um, Notably, it doesn't say other creatures. It also buffs itself, and it's naturally a 6-6 six, six trample. For five. So this thing's going to be big. Um, even if you don't have a huge token board, which is what I think we picture when we picture a plus one counter on each creature you control, you do get to put a lot of power on the board with this card. Um, so we talked about the Defilers and where, where they're best, and I think when we both landed on their best with one drops that are colored pips because it just now they're free yeah the difference between one and zero mm. is huge right the difference between two and one is roughly a 50 percent discount yeah three and two is only a 33 percent discount so you can see as you go up the mana cost the reduction is sort of less impactful until you get to it used to cost one now it costs zero which yeah. is actually an undefined like it's 100% off. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not even 100% off. Yeah. Like, it's more than 100%, right? It's free now where yeah. it was, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I guess technically, yeah, 100% off is free. But You've also just spent five mana to cast this thing, and you really do want to take advantage of it when it comes down because these things are scary. So if you can cast this and then cast a one drop and get some value out of it the turn you cast it, um, I think that's where the one drops are really going to shine. If you can cast two and you have this huge board, um, it, it's going to... It's going to be really powerful. So I think one drops are the best. And I think the green one is best positioned because green's sort of famous for its one mana green permanence, right? This is all of your Lana War Elves and your Elvish Mystic. This is um, Carpet of Flowers, Birds of Paradise, Exploration, uh, green Allosaurus, Shepherd. Green just has a <laughs> lot of one drops. A lot. And if one drops are the best with a Defiler, one drop permanence, we should say, one drop right? Like brainstorm's yes. not good with the blue one because it's not a permanent. It's not a permanent. Yeah, but one drop permanence. I think green has all the good. I mean, has the best one drop permanence. And if you look at like the top hundred cards on EDH, right, it play. It like verifies that basically. Yeah. green's a permanent based color, so it's it's really positioned to take advantage of this well. I think, especially because there's so many powerful one drops in Commander specifically. Yeah, abundant growth and wild growth, and like you, we can name off the top of our head like fifteen or twenty green one drops that see a lot of play in the format. Uh, something that's worth noting, Deathrite Shaman actually works for the Defiler. So hybrid uh, hybrid mana, uh, you could use the black Defiler to pay two life or the green Defiler to pay two life. It's just whenever you would pay green, you may pay two life instead. 
Yeah, so, okay. So that's very powerful. Lots of one drops. I think also green has a lot of synergy with that second ability of the one-one counters. Like right. green is one of the one-one counter colors. Mm-hmm. So Hardened Scales is a card that is one green mana Ugh. for a permanence that also synergizes really well with the Defiler's second ability. Yeah. And then, of course, there are things like... Um, Winding Constrictor, Evolution Sage. Green just has a ton of ways to kind of take advantage of its Defiler, and we're going to see with the other ones. They're fine, but they don't quite synergize with every yes. piece as well. I, you put on the notes like, this is the best one. I think we're going to see the most of the green one, um, just because it is so permanent-based, and because I, I think the Defilers are best in maximum two color decks unless you're very focused in your three color and you're like i'm predominantly green i'm splashing black or something like that um because because it only reduces one color right and i think mono green is just best positioned in the format just generally i think green's just kind of the best color in casual blue obviously is in cdh right. because yeah. uh, you need more interaction but in casual the power level of the average green card is just so high. And, it, and yeah. green can kind of do everything, draw cards, ramp, remove things. Right. Um, so I think we're going to see the most of the Defiler, and I think the rest of the Defiler cycles definitely have their places index, but because green is so specifically permanent-based and is so generally powerful and dominant as a color in Commander, um, the green Defiler is going to be the most powerful. I think actually there's a case, too, that the green one could be played in a three-color deck because the 1-1 one, one counterpart is so powerful. If you just That's had true. 30 creatures in your deck, you will really only need to put 1-1 one, one counters on all your creatures twice, and you're just happy with that card. Yeah. Even, even, you know, barring the cost reduction. You reduce two spells, put two 1-1 one, one counters on all creatures you control. That is worth a card in my deck mm. for the most part. So. For sure, yeah. All right, That's well, let's cute. look at the other ones, and then everybody out there can judge for themselves whether they agree that the green one is the most powerful. Uh, the blue one is Defiler of Dreams. Oof. Three blue blue. For so a, gnarly. <laughs> for a 4-3. Yeah, it's a scary looking thing. <laughs> uh, five mana 4-3 with flying. It's a Phyrexian Sphinx. As an additional cost to cast blue permanent spells, you may pay two life. Those spells cost blue less to cast if you paid life this way. This effect reduces only the amount of blue mana you pay. Remember, you can only do that once per spell. Whenever you cast a blue permanent spell, draw a card. On its face. That's the most powerful one, right? I think if it didn't have the permanent clause. Right. Yes. If you could brainstorm and opt <sighs> and... For free and, and draw visions, a card. Yeah, exactly. No, 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 no. For zero, you just turn those all into get probes that draw you an extra card. Yeah, it would be broken. So I'm, I'm glad they didn't insane. do that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it is specific to permanence. And blue permanence are not as common as you'd think. I mean... So yeah, they I, are. They're not actually that. I I 100 agree with what you said. In fact, they're way less common than I think you would yeah. think. So I have a little t- a thing I did here, which is I counted up the number of permanents per color in the top 25 cards uh, for that color on EDH Rec. Yeah. Okay. Okay. How many of the top 25 blue cards on EDH Rec do you think are permanents? Um, out of 25. Yeah. Like eight. It's four. Wow! <laughs> four is so few. It's mostly instants and sorceries. Right. Because it's very, all your cantrips. Counter spells and cantrips and all that stuff. Especially in the one drop slot. Yeah. Like, I can think of one blue one drop permanent off the Mystic top of my Grimora. head. It's Mr. Grimora. Yeah. Okay. Just for comparison's sake. Yeah. Because in a, in a vacuum, that doesn't mean a lot. Yeah. The green cards, top 25 from EDH Rec, how many of those do you think are permanents? Uh, like 18. 11. 11. Okay. So, so I think we see spells. that the top 25 yeah. kind of skews towards, and you, it would make sense when you think about it, there's like removal and then rampant gross and things like that. Yeah. But still, 11 versus four. It's almost three times as many permanents in green in the top 25 right. as blue. So yeah, I think that automatically kind of colors the blue one and, and how powerful it can even be, just considering that like you might have a lot of blue in your deck, but do you have a lot of blue permanents? Yes. Even so, I looked at this because I have, I have two mono blue decks. Both of them are spells decks. Uh, I looked at Octavia, which is a casual deck. I was like, maybe I can find a spot for it. The whole deck's blue. There are twelve permanents in the whole deck. In the whole deck. It's in the mono whole, blue. In the whole deck. <laughs> I mean, not including the commanders. Right, 15, right. But like, it is incredibly focused on instants and sorceries. And we both have Orvar decks. 
I mean, I run There's like very few. I run like spells. eleven creatures, I think, yeah. in Orver. It's almost all instants that target stuff. Yeah, yes. yeah, and a lot of it's targeting your lands or your artifacts. So, yep. It's um. And if you have eleven yeah. or twelve permanents of the color in your deck, yeah, it's hard to justify even running it because what are you going to do? Draw two cards off this thing? It's just not powerful enough to to play a yeah. card that's like maybe draws you two cards and reduces two mana for the whole game. Right. Um, so there definitely are decks that can take advantage of this, but it's not an every blue deck card. It's like like you have to be very focused. Like like my my partner has a Hakim deck, which is blue auras. It's great in that deck. It's incredible. Right. But it's like that's if a it's very a, narrow build. <laughs> if it's a blue strategy that it's yeah. focused on a permanent type, right. then you probably might be. Right. Let's talk about one drops. You already mentioned Mystic Remora. Yes. It's actually kind of difficult to come up with good one drops that see a lot of play in Commander. Yeah. We were trying to do it. Mystic Remora is off the top of your head, but yep. then it, you're like, okay, Siren Storm Tamer. Okay. I guess. That's good. Yeah. But not a card you see a, t a ton. Not a you ton. See it, but Usually yeah. in tribal synergy. After that, I was like, I don't know, wizard class. Like I, Jimmy and I talked about this recently. How oh, I'm kind of playing wizard class more and more than That's I cool. yeah. than I thought I was. But it's not like a staple card. Like no. now we're way down the list of cards right. that like I don't, definitely don't put wizard class in even most blue decks. It's just a card I've got in three or four decks maybe. Right, and once you can start getting into blue permanents that you think about see the most play, you're getting to like three mana cards, right? So like casting this for five and then casting a Ristic study for two. Like, you have to have seven mana. And you would have to top deck that Ristic Study because you would already cast it. There's no way you're holding it waiting right. for your Defiler to come out, right? Right. So, like, yeah, what are the cards that realistically you would have in your hand at that point? Right. Maybe Ris Mystic Remorse, because that is a card that sometimes you don't right. play super early. But a lot of times you just throw it out there on turn three. Right. Or one, even. Um, yeah. It's yeah. interesting. I, I thought of another thing that Blue has that is a permanent yeah. that works really well with this card, though, which is Clones. That's interesting. Yeah. So if you clone a Defiler, now if you played something that had two blue pips in it, you can reduce both the pips. Yeah. So if you Phantasmal Image this thing, first of all, your Phantasmal Image costs one mana. That's great. And now the next spell you cast is reduced by two, so the Phantasmal Image kind of costs nothing. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in dedicated clone decks or in dedicated, like, if, if you're playing like a Simic deck that runs a lot of clones, I think Simic creature-based decks is actually going to be a good spot for Defiler because there are a lot of, like, green blue creatures that yeah. you could reduce the casting cost of yeah so i love cl cl clones with that yeah uh, notably we didn't mention this before it says whenever you cast a blue permanent spell draw a card um you don't have to use the phyrexian mana in order to get the benefit it's just a cast trigger yeah that's a really good point the green defilers are the same way the so green yeah they're all they're all the same way yeah so even if you don't reduce it although you should be reducing it yeah, almost Especially always. in blue. I because, guess if you're yeah. just going to have one mana left that you don't have anything to do with. But it's even in blue, so you might as well just leave that mana open as a threat to everybody else. Yeah, as a counterspell, even if it's a bluff. Yeah. So speaking of what decks might want it, um, Merfolk, yep. Sea Creatures, Fairy decks, so Tribal Creature decks. Rogue decks tend to lean pretty blue and focus. Pirates, maybe. Pirates. It's your two-color pirates and not three-color pirate. There are there are a lot of tribes that I think can benefit from this, especially tribes that are like less green-focused and more blue-focused. So I actually really like this in a Merfolk deck, um, even though Merfolk do tend to draw a lot of cards anyway. All right, let's move on to the next oh, one here. The oh. other commander at Sweden is Min. Oh, yeah. Min is a permanent based mono blue deck that wants to draw cards. Anyway, I thought about that the other day. It was cool. Uh, yeah, I like Min a lot in general. I've <laughs> yeah, been playing Min's Min a cool. Lot. Sneak lands into play. That's good. It's really cool. All right, let's talk about the white one here, which is Defiler of Faith. Mm -hmm. It is three white, white for a 5 5 Phyrexian human with vigilance. Has that same clause as an additional cost to cast white permanent spells. You may pay two life and reduce the white. We know that text now. Whenever you cast a white permanent spell, create a 1 1 white soldier creature token. This feel this effect feels much smaller than put plus one counters on all your creatures or draw, or draw a card because we know a one one right. token is not worth a card. Right. Uh, it could be better than putting one one counters on all your creatures as if you have one or less creatures. Yeah. But otherwise, I think so. Almost all the time, it's worse. Right. All you have to yeah. do is put two counters on stuff. Yeah. White does have a ton of permanents and has a lot of one drops. Yes. Yeah, this is interesting. I, I figure well, let's just ask this question now yeah. for all of them. Yeah. Of the top twenty five white cards on EDH rec, how many permanents do you think are among them? Green, uh, uh, green was 11. Green was 11. Like 10? It's 12. 12! So white's actually more permanent based in that the top 25 yeah. than green. Um, and it uses a lot of like creature based ramp and uh, like hate bearer type stuff. So that makes sense to me. Uh, notable one drops in white. There's some good ones. Esper Sentinel. Mm -hmm. Mother of Runes. <laughs> Land Tax. 
That's uh, a lot of good ones. Yeah, there's other ones we you can think of, you know, Yoshimaru and things like that that we do see out there. So I think right. white has more than blue for sure. Yeah. One drops. Um, as green has synergy with the 1-1 one, one counters. White definitely does have synergy with the token effect. Um, but to be, I think for this card to feel powerful and feel broken, you really want to be in a dedicated token strategy. So you want to be running cards like Anointed Procession or Cathars uh, Crusade, Felidar Retreat. Um, all permanents, all that will create 1-1 one, one tokens yeah. when you cast them can be reduced by the Defiler. Yeah. Um, and what I what I really like about the Defiler of Faith, though, is this is not an effect that we see in white very much. We don't we don't get like an explosive. There's not a lot of explosive effects in white. It's yeah. sort of like you commit creatures to the board and you <laughs> pay their casting cost, and they're a little bit under costed. Is is like one of white's benefits. So I like that Defiler of Faith does let you double spell earlier. It does let you get some of those like like multi pip creatures into play. There's a lot of like white white yeah, creatures that's true. that are really powerful in commander. There are even a lot of three white uh, yeah, in yes. the casting cost cards, more than most other colors. So I actually li- like where the defiler is positioned in white, but you really do have to be able to take advantage of that. Of I wish that. it made a two two or something. It was a just a little bit stronger. Yeah. Or like it had I it has vigilance or something. Like well it has I, vigilance. Does it? Oh, oh no, not no, the it token. Does. No, the token. Oh right. Like or maybe if the body had flying, I don't know. It just it One feels of the seems a little too good. Maybe no, 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 no. If the if the five five was, oh, was gotcha, flying gotcha. instead of vigilance, then it's like a little bit. Yeah, it'll juice it in a some way a more. little bit. Yeah, yeah. So it's so it's so close, and I do think there are some decks that are going to be really excited about this kind of effect. Uh, one other thing we'll say about white is they it's one of the life gain colors, and because you are paying life uh, for the sort of we're going to call it Phyrexian mana, yeah, um, cost reduction it will be nice to be able to gain some of that back. I think players worry about that a way more than they should. In general, just pay the life. Life for mana is almost always worth it. You've got 40 life. You'll be okay. Yeah, it's not balanced very well for our format because we start with double the life, so it's mm. broken to begin with. But white does have like the Soul Ward and Soul's Attendant stuff, which is also permanent. Also very good. Also one these. drops. Yeah, yep. exactly. So it definitely has nice ways to kind of gain back the life and maybe could just cast all of its spells for the rest of the game paying the two life and not worry about it all has Pretty an sweet. extort mechanic and things like that mm-hmm. yeah I also think white tends to be more permanent based because of cards like Sun, Sun Titan and Sabin's Reclamation and right. because you can put and so like little permanents back into act back into play it's it could be good. It, it'll, it'll be quite good. <laughs> all of these effects are very powerful. Yeah, I think they're all playable and all good. <laughs> yes, for sure. Yeah, we're just comparing it to, or is it the best one? Is it the best one in the cycle, yeah. Yeah. All right, the red one is called Defiler of Instinct. This is uh, only four CMC. It's the only one that's four, right? Very cheap. Yeah, two red red. Is the black one? No, never mind. The black one's also four. We just haven't got to it yet. All right, there's two that are four CMC. All right, this one is two red red for a four four Phyrexian Kavu. Has first strike. Has the as an additional cost to cast a red spell, you may pay two life. Those spells cost red less to cast if you played life this way. Um, and then it says, whenever you cast a red permanent spell, Defiler of Instinct deals one damage to any target. <sighs> that was. <laughs> I hope that sigh was audible. Yeah. <laughs> One damage is so few. They had to be very careful with this card. They had to be very careful. Yeah, because two seems broken. Two is insane. So <laughs> you can't where do you go? Free. Yeah, where you do you go with have it? A, you can't have a free shock in on one v one format. That you on every cast. permanent. Plus, reduce it by two. Plus, Ridiculous. red is the most scary to reduce its stuff uh, just because it is the aggro color. And Okay, before we get into the discussion yeah. about it, let's ask the question. Of the top 25 red cards on EDH Rec, how many do you think are permanents? Uh, six. Nine. Nine. More than I thought. Yeah. Okay. And we're beginning to see how fa- how different blue is than the other colors. Because right. the rest are pretty close. 11, yeah. 12, 9. Yeah. But blue was four. Like, still less than half of red. Is going to be... Yeah. It's... And spoiler alert, black will be closer to the other colors. It's not going to be down there yeah, in the yeah, four. For so, sure, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So... It tells you that the other colors are kind of clumped around the same amount of permanence right. in general or similar. Red's on the low end. Mm. Um, white's maybe a little bit on the higher end. But still, nine's, you know, I don't know. I don't really know how to... Nine out of 25 is still not very high. Yeah. Um, and I think, like, when I think about the red cards that I run the most, they're like 
two mana sorcery draw or instant faithless draw looting, cards. It's faithless looting. Real possibility. Yeah it's, yeah, yeah, it's like the like the new one that that Underworld is two Breach, cards. Jessica's Will. Yeah, the only one you really think of is like Dockside of in your powerful decks, right? Yeah, it's like Docks Docks Dockside and Underworld Breach are both Ragavan permanents. maybe. Yeah, but nobody's playing that much Ragavan. It's good. Professional it's good. face breaker. That's face breaker is good. That's face becoming a uh, staple for me. Yeah, well, let's look at one uh, red one drops. Um, Regavan, Nimble Pilfer. Yeah. Curse of Opulence. I don't know. Do you really play that? Does anybody nah, really play that? Some people play it. Goblin Welder. I mean, it, it was hard to find one drop like, permanent. These are very narrow effects. It's right? similar to blue. How like, okay, yeah. the first one, sure. And then after that, it falls off pretty fast. And there's right. there's just not a lot of one red, red drops that uh, see a lot of play. Yeah, it's... And I, I feel like red has such a difficult time with card advantage, especially if you're dumping a bunch of permanents into play. It's going to be hard to take advantage of this, right? Like, I think if you're reducing the casting cost of a spell, you really want to be like, all right, I cast three spells. And, and the way that you do that is instants and sorceries. Is instants and sorceries, which it doesn't reduce at all. Um, so I feel like red is just in a difficult position to take advantage of this. Because unless you have another way to keep filling your hand, you're like dealing... Especially, it only pings one. So you have to sort of cast two permanent spells to, to make the ping even take out, like, anything. Yeah, I think two takes out a ton of stuff. Two takes out a lot of things. Not as but one, me, yeah. one is not going to kill anything super impactful. So it's like you really want to cast two permanents to do this. And then and then you've cast three permanent spells and in red and you're red out of cards. Yeah, they have to be two red permanent spells, right. too. It's not yeah. like if you're in a two-color deck, you cast... One green, one red. Well, the first one won't proc the Defiler, so it won't right. really matter. One thing you can do is give Death Touch to yes. the Defiler here, and then the one ping suddenly matters. We say this every time we're doing set reviews like this. I think th what you should take from that message is, do I already have Basilisk Collar or Gorgon's Head in right. a deck that has red in it? Then maybe Defiler goes in that deck. Don't say, oh, I'm going to put Defiler in this deck, and now I better put Basilisk Collar and Gorgon's Head, because I don't want right. two cards that only synergize with one card in my deck. This card is going to be great if you are already doing damage to creatures, if you're already... Giving like, death touch. If you touch. already have Pingers, if you already have Death Touch. I think this is great in like a Torbrand deck. It's largely permanent-based. Uh, it tends to have sort of pingy effects anyway. Now it's, three. now it's doing three. That's huge. Um, so you really have to be poised to take advantage Fiery of, Emancipation, of maybe. this one. Yeah, Fiery Emancipation is great. I, I like this in sort of like a group sluggy deck because it does tend to be red permanent based. It's like red enchantments is, is a big part of it. Um, but a lot of the red decks I build are just, they're just instant and sorcery based. So it's going to, I would have a tough time finding a spot for this. All right, let's move on to the last one here. And it is the black one. The Defiler of Flesh. Easily the grossest yeah. name of uh, the... <laughs> I don't want my flesh defiled. I do not. Get out of here <laughs> with that. My dream's fine. <laughs> <laughs> this is a 4-4 four, four Menace for two black blacks. So it's the other 4 CMC one. It says an, as an additional cost, you can reduce it by paying two life. And then whenever you cast a black permanent spell, target creature you control gets plus one, plus one, and gains a menace until end of turn. We call that Menace. Menace. Um, okay, so this is the least impactful effect, effect for, for sure. Because sure. um, um, we don't care that much about plus one, plus one, and menace. The plus one, plus one... You don't care about it at all. It's incidental. The menace, it feels like if you're trying to deal combat damage with creatures or if you're like you're like a big commander. It's not a particularly deck, black thing. It's not, right? not I mean and I don't know, like if you're if you're trying to cast a bunch of black permanents, I don't know how often you're like, Oh yeah, menace. <laughs> yeah. Sweet, I'm gonna get in there for four now instead of three. Yeah. It's it's a little it's a little bizarre. It feels like they couldn't figure out a thing that was probably like fair enough, and so they landed on that because it's very like. This is already something that black is poised to take advantage of. The for, I, in black, the Phyrexian mana. The Phyrexian mana. Yeah. yeah. So paying where black is used to paying life in exchange for mana. It, like you know, Crick is a very popular card, um, and black is poised to gain life, so it's not you know, the life swings is a big deal. So I think they did have to be very careful with the second ability because it's very easy that this card is incredibly cracked. Yeah. Um, you know, and also I'd say black is, we mentioned how white cards often have a lot of white pips. I think black is actually the color that is the most, what's that word, you know. Devoted? They, devoted to themselves. Yeah, like, yes. So there are more black cards with more black pips than any other color. For sure, yeah. If you think of Bolas, the Citadel, and Necro Necropotence, and all kinds mm -hmm. of things, there's plenty of cards that see quite a bit of play that are three black, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I think you're right. 
they they had to be very careful with that second ability. I think we saw that they're like, okay, let's give it a very minor ability so that right. it's just not accidentally broken. Yeah. Let's uh, let me ask the question here bigger. since oh, we're yeah, done for yes. all of them. Of the mm-hmm. twenty five black top twenty five black cards on EDA track, how many do you think are permanents? Ten. So that's what I thought too. I thought yeah. it was going to be on the lower end, but like yeah. right above red, but it's actually the highest. It's thir- Interesting. 13. Okay. And I think it's because a lot of the cards that we think of for black are permanents, like Blood Artist and Zulaport, and a lot of the right. payoffs are actually permanents. Right, yeah. Um, even sense. Necropotence is. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because I think a lot of the removal spells removal and the other spells. utility, but black, yeah. you know, it's weird, but they don't actually tend to play a lot of removal on permanents, or, or sorry, on instants and sorceries. Yeah. A lot of them on their Merciless Executioners and their Shriek Maws and things like that. So Yep, that's true. Yeah, it's interesting. That's true. Black decks are often graveyard base, which means you want it on a permanent. Yeah, I can't bring it. my instants and sorceries back as easily in, yeah, black, not in black, but I can bring my that's creatures very back very easily. Yeah. That makes sense. So I think that's another reason why they had to be careful because it is actually the most permanent based color according mm-hmm. to our little low sample size survey here but yes uh, okay let's look at some of the one drops in black yes there's and they have a lot of really good ones uh, absolutely viscera seer uh, death right shaman on the other side here yeah, absolutely uh this is one of my favorite cards phyrexian reclamation is a great way to follow this up yep there um, are there are a bunch black has a bunch of really good one drops and a lot of two drops too. right we didn't go into two drop blood artist and zulaport, zulaport and, and all that uh, yeah a lot of their staple cards are you know two mana or one mana Mm-hmm. Um, like you said, they've got a lot of pay life synergy. So this is kind of a budding archetype that I think over the years we've seen start to grow and it's still not super supported, but there is some support. They, they're they being cautious with it, but we have definitely seen a couple of commanders that are about how much your life has changed or how much life you've lost this turn. Um, or even just straight up, if you pay life, Varric, the new uh, yes. commander. Yeah. So I think like every set, or every couple of sets, we're getting one or two cards for this archetype. Font yeah. of Agonies is another one. Villas is terrifying with this oh, card. Oh my gosh, yeah. um, Absolutely <laughs> petrifying. <laughs> but Villas is eight mana, seven with this card Se- out. Right. It's yeah. so scary. Villas, I mean, yeah. If Villas hits the board, you should just be scared in general whether the I mean, Defiler's out or not. You're paying two life and one mana for an Animate Dead on Villas. Then you're terrified. <laughs> And you give something menace. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> and plus one, plus one. I mean, yeah. that, that's really what puts it over the top. Turn Blood Artist into a zero one. <laughs> or a one, two, excuse me. And of course, black is also one of the life gain colors. So similar to white, it has the extort mechanic, like Crypt right. Gast. And things like Blood Artist and Zulaport, they drain, so they give life back. So right. they just, black is very good at incidentally just gaining 10 life or 12 life over the course of the game until they, right. and they generally if they kill you with blood artists, yes, they gained a lot of life, but the life gain didn't matter because they killed you. Isn't the big thing. Yeah. yeah I, there's a lot of incidental life gain. There's also a lot of huge chunk life gains like Grey Merchant of Asphodel oh, yeah. or like an Exsanguinate or something like that. Kokusho. Kokusho. So just, yeah, gain 20, deal this yeah. much to everybody. And that's just a good way to kind of balance out the fact that I've spent Phyrexian mana to cast my spells for the last three turns. Right. So I think if you're looking at Deviler Flush, <laughs> so gross. Um then you you really want to be focused on just how many permanents are in your deck and how many of them are black. And the menace thing is like, (laughs) neat. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, I have a feeling the black one will be the one we see the second most. I agree. Even though its second ability is the weakest. Yeah. It's only four mana for a reduction. Yeah. Which is also For one, it's four CMC. And for two, it's just black can take care of it so well. And black Mm -hmm. decks tend to have a lot of black. Yeah, for sure. You know, red decks often are like, the red is uh, 20% of the deck. Mm. White, same thing. Like, but... If you have black in your deck, because you need to cast Necropotence and things like that, you just can't have like... A Yara. 10 black sources in your deck, so you kind of lean more towards black, yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right, one question here before we get off this Defiler cycle. In general, how many permanents of a color do you think you need in your deck before you can run one of these Defilers? Because I think that's a better indication than how many colors you're in. Because again, if I have a three-color deck that's Bant, but it's mostly Mostly green green and blue, and white's only 10%, I might be able to run the green and the blue Defiler. Yeah. Even though technically I have white, but a lot of times I only have seven white cards or something. It feels like it does have to be high still. So you're you're running 30 to 7 lands or something like that. Yeah. if you're running the black one, it feels like you want to have like 30. Like it it feels like you want to be able to cast two spells that are in your hand with it. Yeah. 25 is the number we generally say yeah. if you have something that kind of indicates you have a theme of it or enough of it that the payoff cards start to matter. Right. And I think we're probably in that realm as well. Yeah. Where somewhere around 25 permanents of a color means that you could, you know, start yes. to con- consider. Now, the green one, I think you would want most of those... Or your deck to also have a lot of creatures. Right, yeah. Um, the blue one, you just have to have a lot of permanents. That's, the blue one feels very hard to play. 
It does. It's it's going to be the toughest one to build around, and it has the most powerful effect. So the decks that want it want it, but there's just a few decks. But a deck with thirty blue permanents in it is a very strange enchantress deck. Is, yeah, or a is merfolk, like, or a merfolk. Or, it's so a even like sea creature something. decks not going to be that because usually you've got ten or eleven, yeah, but you can't have thirty because they're eight mana. You know? Yeah, they're huge. <laughs> so like the the one blue cost reduction doesn't feel like that big of a deal. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's going to be interesting. I'm curious to see where that one shows up because it does feel like people are going to try. And I think it's going to be, people are going to play it once and be like, I haven't drawn a blue permanent yet. And if you build your whole deck so that you can take advantage of the Defiler, well, what if you don't draw it? Like, you don't you know, what it. if you don't have it? Then your deck is like playing a bunch of You're in little blue, you don't blue have permanents. For it. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. It's like in Simic Creature decks, I think is where it'll show up the most when you're playing like your Coiling Oracles and that kind of thing. We'll see. All right. Uh, we're done with the cycle now. We're not going to go over the tribal cycle. P- again, play that if you've got elves or whatever. Um, now we're going to go through the cards in the 99 that aren't cycles. We're going to go through these in a different way than we have in the past. Usually we split them up by color. Mm-hmm. For whatever reason this time, I decided to split them up alphabetically. Hell yeah. So we're just going to go down alphabetically. So if you're looking for a specific card, it'll be easier to find maybe this way. The first one is one you're excited about, I, Rachel. I love this card, and I understand it's not for everybody, but it's Chaotic Transformation. It's a six-mana sorcery. <laughs> <laughs> for five it's not for me is what you just said five and a red <laughs> <laughs> it says exile up to one target artifact up to one target creature up to one target enchantment up to one target planeswalker and or up to one target land so you do not need to have all of these targets uh, to cast this spell uh, for each permanent exiled this way its controller reveals cards from the top of their library until they reveal a card that shares a card type with it puts that card onto the battlefield then shuffles <laughs> so it sort of polymorphs each card type right each permanent type each permanent type yeah and it's interesting because the if you you know hit an enchantment with this it goes and finds the next enchantment not the next permanent right it's. I think it's very interesting. I think most of the time you're going to want to cast this in a deck that you're you're interested in polymorphing stuff. So you're like, okay, I'm poly. Uh, my deck is designed to polymorph creatures, um, but there's also that problem land over there. So it it has the. It's like a cool po- polymorph effect that you can also just be like, you know what. I cannot beat a propaganda. I'm going to get the propaganda out of there and we'll see what 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 comes out next. Obviously, it's not a great removal spell. It does get replaced, but. Um, I think in a deck that's designed to cast big spells or to reduce the casting cost of this thing, um, you can do some very neat moves with this card. Um, We should say, yeah, it... It's not like Chaos Warp. It will find it, it gets something. So yeah. it, it's going to go until it hits that permanent type that you've destroyed. Is it destroy? Exile. That you've exiled. And then it will put that onto the battlefield. So they can't whiff like they can with Chaos Warp. Right. Um, yeah, it's interesting because the Polymorph decks that I've seen are mostly polymorphing their own stuff, usually tokens. Right. And usually what they do is they're creating tokens as their small creatures, and all the rest of the actual creatures in the deck are big. Right. Cost seven or eight mana. Right. Um, it's so, yeah, this is like like in a Kaikar deck is a very classic uh, red polymorph deck. Um, I think there's opportunity for you to like uh, to chaos warp like a treasure token and a creature, and maybe you're like, you know what, this enchantment isn't doing what I want. I can't trigger it. I'll flip those, and I'm gonna exile that guy's cradle or th- that Nick those or something like that. And um, yeah, it feels like land is a gimme. Because it's very easy for you to hit something that's worse than what they've got. Because they're very gonna, much, yeah, yeah. Because if you can see a feel of the dead or something like, there's get it. There's very few better hits in their deck. Most of the time, they're going to get a basic or just a regular dual land of some kind, right? Um, and it's hard for them to build a deck that has so few lands that you have to hit something awesome, yeah. Whereas if you hit somebody's creature, you can definitely roll into something worse, be- for sure. Because a lot of decks just have you know, a few at least big things. Right. You so, need to sort of predict what their deck's doing and what they're right. likely to have in it before you can really reliably target a thing. But sometimes it's like, well, there is a new Lamog there now. Right. And whatever I'm going to give them off the top of their library is unlikely to be as good as a new Lamog. Right. It could just be a secure tribe elder or whatever. So, yeah, yeah that's what you want to sort of calculate is your, your chance to, um, to sort of make something that's worse than what they've got. But in general, you see this as something where you're using it more for your own stuff and right. just the there's the additional upside that I could hit their stuff. Right. I th- and I think like it obviously doesn't go in every deck and there is going to be a deck building restriction. You need to know your deck very well in this to be like, oh, I exiled a soul ring and I got a signet. Shoot. Like you have to know 
what you could hit or what you could miss and what's the worst and what you're hoping for. So it is a deck building restriction, but I like that it um, is has both upside and sort of has free re- removal spells stapled to it. Um, I like any removal spell. Like I like a decimate a lot that has just a free land removal spell. Because I think in our format, people do not look at land removal well. Like if you have a strip mine on the battlefield, people are like, that's a strip mine. That's scary. You're mean. Um, but so, but having, but having like a free like land removal spell, that's just a staple to other stuff. People don't, aren't worried about it as much. You should have at least a, a way or two in your deck to get rid of a land because Definitely. there is just, there's certain lands that are just very hard to beat and you got to have a way around. Like, yeah. You can't just be dead to a guy's cradle or, or even a like a glacial chasm or a nickthos or Ugh, glacial yeah. chasm. You're in trouble. Maze of Ith can also just be a huge problem for certain decks. So yeah, yeah. I don't think it, Going after a land, like cards that get rid of singular lands are, are definitely shouldn't be looked down upon. I don't think they are either, but I do think that they have this sort of stigma still, especially in casual decks where it's like, if you're running just a just a single one, they're like, oh, you have a land removal in your deck? And so I like that it has just sort of a that option and it gives you, it's a good like second spot. So if you're running like Ghost Quarter and this, you have two land removal spots and Beast Within, you have three. Um, I can see running this card in a deck that already is caring about the top of its library as well. So if you sure. can, if you have a scroll rack in your deck mm-hmm. because it's synergizing with other things you're doing and you're in red, then this is a card you could consider because there might be a point in the game where you just know what's there. Right. And so you can just be like, cool. In normal circumstances, I would not get rid of my soul ring because I might get a signet. But in this case, I know there's a worm coil engine there. So right. I'm just going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. As in addition to the other things that I would, I'm going to roll the dice on and not know. I also just like cards like this because they make for cool moments in commander games. Like, is it the best removal spell in red? Absolutely not. But you're like, oh, I played this card and this crazy thing happened and it was amazing and we all laughed. And any card that can make for a crazy moment in a game, I'm, I'm down for people to try out in their decks. All right, yeah, we've all had that uh, chaos warp happen where you, they flip the card that you chaos warped or oh, something like God. that. That's the worst, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's go on to the next one. This is a little bit controversial within the command zone office, so a lot of people are on both sides of the fence of whether this is even playable kind of or not. It is cut down, which is uh, one black for an instant. Destroy target creature with total power and toughness five or less. So you take the power and the toughness of a creature, you add it up if it's five or less, then this can target it. And in that case, it is a one mana instant removal spell. It's it's so efficient. It's incredibly efficient. Um, so it, it, you have to look at it because you're like, it's so cheap and it can hit any, it's not a non-black creature. It's not a non-artifact creature. It's it's going to be those little um, those little value creatures that I think we see a lot of scary mana dorks, hate bears, um, uh, Dranth magistrate. magistrate, which like yeah, I mean I think our format has as it's sped up the little it's speeding up because there are a lot of playable low drop creatures and those tend to have small toughness, yeah, uh, a small power as well. So those tend to all be hittable. Uh, here's some of the top targets yeah. of cards we see a lot. So Esper Sentinel. Yeah, huge. Douthy Voidwalker. Mm-hmm. Timna, Thrasios, Ragavan, Professional Facebreaker, which we just talked about. Beast Whisperer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I put Storm Kill Nardis on here, but you correctly pointed out that that's a little iffy because it does grow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Although if you don't, you need to kill the storm coming artist as soon as you see it. I think I've demonstrated that multiple times now. For on sure. Nights, that like, if you allow someone to untap with storm killing artist, you're probably dead or close to it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's like an archmage emeritus. A lot of those like little, but there are just tons of like early creatures running around now that, cause people just it used to be, Hey, I'm not going to do much till turn three. And that's just not a thing really mm-hmm. anymore. So I think that I started playing lightning bolt. Like, yeah. I started just straight up playing Lightning Bolt like a couple years ago. And when I, they pre-printed Hull Breacher, I started playing Lightning yeah. Bolt. I was and like, I'm no been, way, am I, I not going to be ready? <laughs> I've been very happy with it. And I would say that Cut Down is probably very close to equivalent to Lightning Bolt. Lightning Bolt mm-hmm. is a little better maybe because it can hit a Planeswalker or, and it can fa- go to face. Mm-hmm. But it, they're, in a, they're in a similar space. So we, did, we had Truck crunch some numbers here. And just to see like... What does cut down hit as far as percentage of cards we see a lot in the format? So of the top 100 commanders, again, according to the ADH rec, cut down will hit 29 of them. Mm -hmm. So a third of the most popular commanders. And then of the top 100 creatures played in the format, cut down will hit 57 of them. Okay. Now that's a little bit misleading because... Some of the creatures in the top 100 creatures are Doxi Extortionists. Don't care that much if I, right. if you kill it. It's already done things. Sakura Tribe Elder, Mole Drifter, things like that. Right. Things where it's like, eh, it technically counts as a creature it could hit, but 
those have already gotten you their value or done their thing or yeah. secure tribe builder it's going to do its thing in response to you you know you're not no one removes a secure tribe builder no. uh, so this yeah. goose the numbers a little bit for sure it's it's interesting so i i think a general rule for this is the faster your meta is the spikier your meta is the more powerful it's going to be because i think a lot of the targets for this are going to be they're going to be hate bears yeah a lot of them and if your meta is not playing hate bears it's just not going to find a target because it needs to be a little creature that has a permanent effect on the board is, is like what will hit removal spell most of the time. So well, an S for Sentinel. The speed of your and, play group too, right? Yeah. Like if they are just, cause the slower your play group is what slow, usually the way that it manifests is just like not as many plays early. Right. Whereas the faster a deck is, the more it's doing earlier. And right. that means the more likely it is to be playing a creature that is just small because you can't, it's very hard to play a, you know, a lot of things and a very big creature early. Yeah. So. I think, like, when I start first, my meta started speeding up and people started switching from all, like, rampant growth and two mana stuff to more, uh, like, Land of War Elves and Elvish Mystic and the ramp started coming out a turn earlier and it was creature-based. That That is when sort of the pivoting point that I think cut down becomes more valuable is if you're seeing creatures on turn one or two or uh, you where you think there's going to be a target for this most of the time. But yeah, if your if your play group is like, I don't know, we still all run like like Cultivate and Kodama's Reach is pretty pretty typical like Three regular rocks in general. Yeah, um it's going to it's not going to have the targets you want it to have. Yeah, cuz you're probably if you can play 3 mana rocks and Cultivate Kodama's Reach, you know, regularly, it probably means that your play group is slow enough that you're really kind of waiting for bigger things to happen. Right. That are impactful. And it's just not going to be good. Like, yeah. you're not going to be able to remove this, the spell. You're not going to be able to remove a Tali, which you need to be able to remove. Or, like, even right. a Seedborn Muse. You can't hit a Seedborn Muse yeah. with this. Yeah, that's true. Um, okay, yeah. so here's the question Will you personally play Cut Down in any of your decks? I don't have a deck for Cut Down right now. Um, but it's my most powerful decks are not in black. Um, so it's like the decks that I'm playing at the top end just just aren't are don't have black spells <laughs> it's a mild and blue so and in your more casual decks yeah you just wouldn't play because it's probably not gonna be good because i don't i don't think it's gonna find a target most of the time our our play group doesn't play a lot of a lot of the early hate bear stuff a lot a lot of the taxi creatures that i would be worried about like esper sentinels certainly and some mana dorks like the uh, like hitting circle of the dreams druid or something like that is a really big deal but i think too often it's not going to find a target in most of the games that i'm playing yeah, I'm on the fence. I, I I think I probably won't play it that much, but I might have a deck or two where it'll, it'll go in there. I just mm -hmm. don't think that that's my problem in my black decks. Yeah. My black decks don't seem to be like, oh boy, I ke really can't deal with the creatures I need to deal with. There's just a lot of good creature removal. Even, like, I would run Baleful Mastery over this. Even just Merciless Executioner, Fleshbag Marauder type stuff. Like, in general, my black decks they tend to have not a problem of like, I can't keep the creatures under control. Their problem right. is I can't keep the artifacts and the enchantments under control. Like, so cut yeah. down doesn't solve that problem. And so the fact that the downside is, and sometimes it won't even remove the creatures. Yeah. It's like, I, I think, yeah, I would rather just play, you know, some of that permanent based removal and run defiler. Yeah. 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 I think I'm way more likely to run defiler in my decks, my all my black decks than I am cut down. Yeah, I, I think cut down is going to be best in like your efficient spell based decks. So like a cast deck, I think would love a cut down because um, it gives you more selection and gives you more. You cast it twice. It makes it a lot and, better. Yeah, yeah. And it's the efficiency really matters. Um, but when I'm running like targeted black removal, I, I really want it to hit what I need it to hit. <laughs> and like cast, I want it to recur. And the easiest way for that to yeah. happen is if it's Shriekmon, not if it's yeah. cut down. Yeah, for sure. OK, let's move on to the next card here. In the alphabetical order. Yeah, it's Karn's Silex. This card's cool. It's a three mana legendary artifact. It enters the battlefield tapped and it says players can't pay life to cast spells or activate abilities that aren't mana abilities. Sorry, defilers. Yeah. <laughs> cool defiler there. Uh, Karn's got a bowl for you. Uh, and it also has an activated ability that says X tap. Exile Karn Silex, destroy each non-land permanent with mana value X or less. Activate only as a sorcery. So it's a new uh, uh, for Venerals disc. And Pernicious Deed, I think, is the first thing you look at it when, sure, when I look at this. Sure, yeah. It's a cross between those two things almost. Because it comes yeah. in tapped, and it's kind of a board wipe, but it's a 
board wipe that says X or less. You're down. Yeah. Yeah. It's, but it's also it has, a, hate, a hate card, and it's a, sort of a new kind of hate card. Right? We, we haven't seen a lot of this. We've seen a little. Yeah. Where you can't pay life to activate abilities. Um, and I think the major thing I think of the first thing when I read that is like, oh, it turns off fetch lands. Yeah. Uh, immediately scary. It's worth noting it's fetch lands are not mana abilities. Um, you're searching. Um, it's, it's like you can, you can pay life to make mana, but you can't pay life to do anything else. Right. And there's just a lot of cards that pay life these days. A oh, yeah. lot of powerful cards. Maybe not number of cards, but the cards that do it are powerful. Bolus' Citadel, Aetherflux Reservoir. Uh, this prevents you from paying the life to f- Force of Will. Necropotence, Crick, Son of Yogmoth, all of the Defilers. Um, and any use of just on in print Phyrexian mana. So your G- uh, Gitaxian Pro, Noxious Revival. Uh, revival type stuff. Yeah, anything that has a Phyrexian mana, Phyrexian metamorph, already yeah. on it, you mm-hmm. could cast it as normal. You just can't you pay just the, can't the life the instead. Right. Yeah. So there's a decent amount of stuff that it, that it stops, but it's not so much, I think, that it would be worth playing on its own. And right. that's, this is where the card sort of becomes hard to evaluate because the second it's, ability... Yeah. Well, let's talk about what it doesn't stop, I guess, the pay life stuff that you would think that it would stop, right. but it doesn't. So pain lands doesn't stop because that's a mana ability. Mm-hmm. Uh, Talisman doesn't stop the horizon lands horizon canopy fiery islet those kind of things does not stop yep um sylvan library timna those are triggered abilities doesn't they, stop they're those not things. activated yeah with it. yeah uh so there's a lot of good cards that you would sort of immediately would come to mind and say oh it stops that but it doesn't right. so that's kind of a downside ad nauseum you are losing life equal to the converted mana cost okay. you're not paying life so so after you it won't even stop ad nauseum yeah yeah, it's, yeah. It's interesting because, like, incidentally, that's a pain in the butt. Like hitting, hitting, uh, yeah, your your fetch lands and stuff is is annoying. Yeah. Um, and if you don't have fetch lands in your deck, and a lot of people like those are expensive cards. Yeah. This is a way to sort of combat. Like, I got one card that's going to turn off all the expensive cards in my opponent's deck that I do not own. Yeah. That you know that's pretty seductive as a reason to play a card. Yeah. Um, but I don't know that it's good enough. Definitely not on its own. The question right. is like, because you wouldn't pay a four mana artifact that just stops paying life. No, these, right? it's just not, it, it just doesn't affect as enough decks. So the question becomes, how good is the second ability and is the combination of the right. two make it, pl- you know, something that we could play? So let's look at the close comps, the close comparisons yeah. that you mentioned earlier. So we've got Navinuril's Disc, Perilous Fault, and mm-hmm. Pernicious Deed that are kind of all in this family. Right. Uh, because the artifacts, Navinuril's Disc and Perilous, uh, Perilous Fault, they both come into play tapped. Mm-hmm. And both of those, Nervinuril's Disc says, pay one, tap, and destroy all artifacts, creatures, and enchantments. Yep. Notably doesn't have Planeswalkers, which sometimes matter. Yeah. Perilous Vault is pay five, tap, exile the Perilous Vault, exile all non-land permanents. hmm And then Pernicious Deed is an enchantment that has that ability, pay X, sacrifice Pernicious Deed, destroy each artifact, creature, and enchantment with converted mana cost X or less. Again, that does not have Planeswalkers. Right. But that is the sort of like, okay, pick a number, and then below that number, CMC stuff goes away. Right, a similar effect. Lands. Yeah, and so the question is like, you know, it comes in tap, so you can't use it the turn you, you can't play do it, it. Which is, is a huge upside on Pernicious Deed. Um, so here's where I think the biggest difference is. So out of those three, I think Nibiduril's Disc and Pernicious Deed see the most play. And I think they see the most play in decks that can use them over and over and over and over again. Notably, Karn Silex exiles when you activate it. Um, so once, once you've exiled all of these permanents, that's, that's it. We've done it. Like, I, I think Pernicious Deed and Invenerals Disc are in decks like Muldrotha where, or like, uh, like Artifact decks where you can keep re- recurring the Invenerals Disc and just have a board wipe if you need it. Or Nev's Disc also works really well if you can give it indestructible. So it won't actually, you don't have to sacrifice it. It's supposed to destroy itself when it does its thing. Right. But yeah, if you have Avacyn or something out, you can just board wipe every turn. Yeah. And crazy. they both work really well in Super Friends deck, which is another reason we see them quite often because yeah. they destroy everything but Planeswalkers because they just existed before the card type Planeswalker was a thing. Right. So, yeah, those are reasons those two cards see play. And Perilous Vaults you almost never see, but I think it's actually a pretty close comp in that it costs four. And how often are you going to activate Karn Silex for less than five? Right. Although being able to choose does matter. If you just have a deck that's just high CMC in general, then maybe it becomes better because I can make it more one-sided because most of my stuff 
Yeah. You know, I can just pick four and then I have more five plus drops than everybody else. Yeah. Even like even picking three and just hitting everybody else's. You're like, I'm not relying on mana rocks. I'm in a mono green deck that does. That's land all ramp. land ramp. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you can pop this for three and get rid of everybody's like little setup pieces, everybody's incidental little equipments and that kind of mana thing. Rocks, yep. It is a, a pretty serious deck building restriction. And uh, you need to be aware of that kind of thing if you can take advantage of. I mean, I think you have to look at your current decks and say, do any of them fit that mold? Because you can't build a deck that works well with Karn Silex. You have to have a deck that Karn Silex naturally fits into. For sure. The other thing I would say, it's easy to miss, but Karn Silex is also only activated as a sorcery. None of these other cards do, and that's actually a huge, huge downside. Yeah. Because one of the things you get to do with all these cards is hold the whole table hostage. Mm -hmm. You get to be like, play it, pass Pass. turn. And people are like, crap, I don't want to play anything because they're going to activate the thing. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, and they can activate it at any time. But if you can't activate it during their turns, if you didn't activate it, Rachel's just free to try and remove it or whatever during yep. my turn because I, I can only activate it as a sorcery. So that actually, I think, makes it a lot worse. I actually think this card is probably like borderline not playable. It's You really do have to be able to take advantage of it. And I think the added pay life thing comes close, but it I don't think it adds enough value over something like Nivenerals Disc or Pernicious Steed. Um, the main... The main thing that's going to be the difference, I think, is that it's colorless. Obviously, Pernicious Steed can't go into a lot of decks. Um, if you're just really hurting for board wipes and you're like, I keep getting smoked by my friend's Enchantress deck, or and you're in black, or you're in uh, in blue that's a or good something point, like right, that. Certain colors have trouble dealing with certain permanent types, and that does X out all non-land permanents. Right. Yeah. It, um, it, and it does hit planeswalkers if you're like you know and i can't i just can't compete with this certain thing um this is an answer to that it's i i would say it's a slow answer and it's um because you can also play it it comes in tapped and they just destroy it before it gets back to your turn and right. it still did not answer it because they get a yeah. whole turn cycle and even with untap effects you still have to be able to untap it and pay the mana and then probably exile your untapper yeah i just don't think this card is good it's um I, I think they're both just better options. I think most of the time New Minerals disc is just gonna be better. All right, let's move on to the next card, which is a very interesting one. It is oh, sorry. That was a good tease though, because I just noticed that we can't go on to the next card. Because we have to take a quick break and hear a message from our sponsors. But the next card is a very interesting one. So mm-hmm. we'll be right back. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Well, well, well. Looks like you're in a bind, and only one card in your entire deck might save you. I, Demonic Tutor, <clears throat> am here to help you. In a game of magic, I can find whatever answer you need. Sadly, beyond the game, cardboard can't fix everything. That's where BetterHelp Online Therapy comes in. Speaking with a therapist can help you stop fixating on problems by teaching you to work towards solutions and become a better problem solver. For me, speaking with my therapist, Greg, helped me overcome my anxiety with public speaking. Now, I'm not just a private tutor. I'm an adjunct demonology professor at Seven Hells Technical College. Just fill out a brief survey and BetterHelp will search their deck of qualified therapists to find your perfect match. And you can switch at any time. It's convenient, entirely online, and affordable. It certainly won't cost you your immortal soul like I do. (laughs) Wait, I just cost two mana? That seems broken. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash command zone today to get 10% off your first month. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash command zone. Avast, me hearties. The name's Zara, renegade recruiter, and I'm looking to grow me pirate crew. For years, I searched me opponent's measly hands and found only scurvy dogs. But then I started using Indeed, the hiring partner that lets you attract, interview, and hire all in one place. It'd be the only job site where you're guaranteed to find candidates that meet your must-have requirements. Or you don't pay a doubloon! Indeed is your first mate at every step of the hiring process, helping to find great talent while saving time with tools like virtual interviews. Plus, there's my favorite part of Indeed, assessments. With Indeed assessments, I know that candidates have already proven their mettle before the interview. By choosing from over a hundred skill tests to add to a job post, I can select for only me true perfect crewmates. With Indeed, I have a treasure map to the grandest booty of all, qualified enthusiastic employees. 
Yar! Indeed's doing something no other job site has done. Now with Indeed, businesses only pay for quality applications matching the sponsored job description. Visit Indeed.com slash command zone to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash command zone. Again, Indeed.com slash command zone. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Hello, I'm Dryad of the Elysian Grove, here to talk to you about Me Undies, the comfortable underwear company that's taking the internet by storm. Now me, I never wear underwear. I like to feel the breeze on my vines. But when the open air gets nippy, I snuggle up with Me Undies collection of clothes and accessories. That's right, Me Undies makes more than just underwear. They've got durable, cushy socks that make my feet sing. Just call me Dryad of the Elysian Groove, baby. Plus, they're super stretchy loungewear. Daily tees, shorts, and even rompers to add some silky softness to every phase of the day. Look, I even got this Catwoman hoodie for my dog. <laughs> like a tree, his bark is worse than his bite. Because trees don't bite, unless you ask nicely. Wink. And everything's available in sizes extra small through 4XL with tons of prints and more colors than I let your lands produce. So make like a me and leaf discomfort behind with soft and sustainable me undies. MeUndies has a great offer for fans of the Command Zone. For any first-time purchasers, you get 20% off plus free shipping and returns. To get 20% off your first order, free shipping, and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, go to MeUndies.com slash command. Again, that's MeUndies.com slash command. All right, we are back. We are. I'm here with uh, KEG member Rachel Weeks, Game Hello. Nights alum, and just all-around commander aficionado. Uh, we are talking about the cards that go into your 99 from Dominaria United. We are picking up where we left off with a very interesting card. Super cool card. I'm really excited about this one. It's the phasing of Zalfir. It is a saga for two blue and a blue. And this has the new saga effect, read ahead. I'm going to read the reminder text. It says, choose a chapter and start with that many lore counters. Add one after your draw step. Uh, skipped chapters don't trigger sacrifice after the third chapter. So it's a saga that you can start in the middle of. Or at the end. You can or just say, end. I only want chapter three. That's all I'm getting. And that's really important for this one because the first two chapters uh, on this enchantment for two blue blue says another target non-land permanent phases out. It can't phase in for as long as you control phasing of Zalfir. So you can just phase out one thing until this saga leaves. And then you get to do that twice, twice if you start in chapter one. Yep. And then the final chapter says, destroy all creatures. For each creature destroyed this way, its controller creates a 2-2 black Phyrexian creature token. It is a blue enchantment that says destroy all creatures. Destroy. Destroy. Blue doesn't really do that. What? There's that one that turns everything into pigs, kind of, and it destroys Yeah, but that first. exiles. Oh, yeah, so you're right. So this is like destroying multiple creatures. <laughs> So this is even more weird than I thought this it was. It doesn't really happen in blue that often. So it's really it's really interesting. Um, yeah, I think it's something we haven't seen blue be able to do. I'm not sure that blue is really missing this effect. Like bouncing all creatures is often better than destroying. Exiling yeah. uh, mo usually better. We don't see a lot of Curse of the Swine, but still. It just, also gives them all two twos after they leave. So it's not just a clean. The it's not yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah comparison it's I not guess. just a clean board wipe but we don't care that much about tutus well, in general tutus? everybody yeah. ever played exodron it's always great yeah your, your opponents always hate it it's never Terrible. you're never like oh crap they got a bunch of tutus you're just always happy about it and this also has the ability so you can phase out any non-land permanent in the first two chapters so you're like i i really need to keep this permanent in play i'm going to skip to chapter two i'm going to phase this out and then at the beginning of my next main phase i'm going to destroy all creatures yeah, this is ahead, a possibility the read ahead is really big because often when you need a board wipe you need it to happen now no. so it would be yes. fair. I think it would be quite bad if you had to start chapter one. But, mm -hmm. the, but sometimes you don't need your board wipe right now. Yeah. Um, and board wipes that are sort of looming do weird things to games. Make like we said, people not want to play things. So yeah. you can, yeah. Just the fact that this is a thing that is just this tidal wave is on its way, and they, everybody can see it. Will often cause them not to play cards, and it does sort of remove a thing, yeah. and then remove a thing again, and. A, once this goes off and it destroys the creatures, gives the two twos, it leaves the battlefield and the stuff will phase back in. Mm -hmm. But two turns is a long time. Even one two turn turns can, is a long time. can be a long time in commander. Uh, can hit their commanders, which is interesting. We yeah. don't have a lot of sort of quote unquote permanent ways to get rid of commanders. I don't know if you've played against out of time at all yet. <laughs> it's brutal. <laughs> If you're it's not, so good. <laughs> yeah, out of time is an insane card. If you haven't played uh, with or against it yet, try it out because there are lots of decks that just cannot function without their commander. Mm -hmm. And we don't, and phasing is a way to sort of 
it's get, gone. They can't do anything. It's not changing zones in a way that allows them to put it back in the command zone. Mm. So they just do lose complete access to it, which there are lots of decks where you just do that, you've beat that deck. They can't do anything. That's it. Yeah, the yeah. whole deck is designed to work with this card in play. So it's interesting because... If you do this whole thing, it comes in, I would think the first thing you do is exile somebody's commander. The second thing you do is maybe protect one of your own things, and then there's a board wipe. Or, I, I think that's possible, or you just slam it, destroy everything, we were going to die, we can't do that. Or two commanders, right? Your commander, next turn your commander, next turn destroy everything. The, the mm. downside with that is when you do destroy the stuff, the two they, commanders they are phased stay. out. They do stay in play. <laughs> yeah, so you, you could even hit your own stuff with the phasing. Yeah, yeah, that's So I mean. that you save it. Yeah. Yeah. But man... Phasing somebody's commander out for two turns is a very big deal. Imagine you're like a Corval deck and you're like, phase it out for two turns. They like, probably just lose. Yeah. I mean, two turns is an eternity in commander. So it's it's very interesting. There are also upsides to it being on a permanent. There's a lot of commanders that can take advantage of this. Uh, Tameshi Reality Architect. Uh, this is disgusting with Tameshi because you can just keep bringing it back every turn. Uh, you can bounce it back to your hand after the triggers on the stack with a bounce spell, like a capsize or a chain of vapor. Yeah, so you can, it hits chapter three, puts the destroy all creatures thing on the stack, and you're cool. like, cool, before I have to sacrifice it because it's chapter three, I'll bounce it back to my hand. So you destroy all things, and now they know you got the board wiper in their hand. Yeah, that's pretty brutal. It's it's pretty crazy. Um, and obviously something like a Moldrotha deck, you can you can just keep casting, casting it, it whenever you need it. Moldrotha um, deck. You can also copy it. Like Orvar can copy it. Oh, well, that's interesting. So you you copy it and then you're just still phasing stuff out and every turn there's a board wipe because it doesn't destroy itself as yeah. a board wipe because it's an enchantment. Yeah. So you could just, oh, the copying's brutal in Orvar. It's... Because once you've got it, you just go, okay, copy it. And now copy it again, copy it again. And for the next like three turns, there will be a board wipe and I will phase something out. And then that will do that again. Yeah. It gives you time That's to brutal. like put stuff in your hand and, and just keep the board clean. Ugh. A cool thing you can, if you can get indestructible on a crafty cut purse, you can get all the tutus. That's pretty fun. <laughs> 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 so, I got you. Yeah, exactly. You thought you were getting tutus. I'm getting them all. That's, That's pretty, pretty cool. fun. I think a powerful use of this card is going to be the phasing and the forever phase. Just watching out of time and how like mm. how it works. If you can phase out somebody's commander for three or four turns, that's, for all intents and purposes, the rest of the game. Yeah. Uh, and all you have to do is remove counters from the saga to keep mul maybe multiple keep things everything. phased out. Yeah, like the she's she well, You will eventually phase out everything, won't you? If you just keep doing it. Yeah, I mean, you it? have to live for a number of turns. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so clock spinning will remove a counter. Will remove a counter every turn. And it has Orvar. buyback. Orvar. Yeah. <laughs> this is going in Orvar, I yeah, think. Gross. Yeah, gross. Uh, so yeah, you power can... Power conduit? Re remove a counter, and on your main phase, you can, yeah, just keep keep using it. Power conduit's cool. Yep, there's, there's stuff a, like soul diviner. Like, there's a bunch yep. of things that just say remove a counter remove from a, a permanent counter control. Remove a counter and keep it going. And then if you're like, you know what, the board's gotten out of the hand, blow it up. Bounce it. Play it again. <laughs> But I think if you just go remove your commander next to remove your commander, that is uh, that is very powerful on a card. That is like when we used to tuck commanders. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, notably... Uh, it's mean. If you phase, it, it, is, it is extremely rude. Um, <laughs> but if you phase a commander out, it doesn't change zones. So they do not have the opportunity to put it back in the command zone if something phases out or in. So that's why it's so powerful against commanders specifically because phasing does, there's no ETB, there's no change of zones. So they don't get to replace that effect and send it back to the command zone. It's interesting because now with Out of Time and this and Teferi's Protection is another phasing card. Mm -hmm. um, Feels like R&D is sort of playing around in the phasing space. Do you see there being a day maybe when the RC has to make a tuck rule-like change to phasing to allow players to not, you know, because there's, they don't, they clearly don't like it when there are cards that say, no, the commander itself is right. not accessible to the player. Right, yes. It's interesting. I mean, there, there's a there's a couple of effects that do this right now, and I don't think they're a huge problem. Like, there's the black one that phases phases a creature out yep. uh, uh, on the enchantment, and then there's out of time, which isn't seeing a ton of play because it does phase all of your stuff out too. And but we've got things like Song of the Dryads, Imprisoned in the Moon, which are yeah. similar but not the exact same. You can remove those enchantments, right? Uh, um, to to prevent that stuff from happening. It's. I think there has to be an answer to commanders. I think there. The, w with the way that they just keep making more and more powerful commanders, if you're playing in a meta where there's like 
there, this commander is too busted and we cannot interact with it and we just need it to stay gone, especially if you can reduce casting cost or you can keep, just keep bringing it back. Right. Which are a lot of commanders. Which are a lot of commanders um, can can really make them... It's nice to have the phasing is what you're saying. It's, I think it's nice. And I, I think giving people at least a way to interact with the command zone is valuable. I mean, I do pine for the old days and I was against the tuck roll change and I think I still would be mm-hmm. to this day where, you know, you had to take that into account in deck building and you couldn't just build your deck so it didn't work at all yeah. without your commander. You had to be able to, you know... But some people don't like that at all, so I understand. And a lot of these phasing permanents are until they leave the battlefield. So it does. it is similar to, to like, turning it into a tree or a forest or something right. like that, where you still, like, if you have a removal spell, you can get it out. Um, where Tuck is like, <laughs> once it's in your deck, hope you draw it. Good yeah. luck. And it obviously um, favored certain colors because certain colors could tutor and some can't. But I guess so yeah. does the enchantment thing, because certain colors can get rid can of enchantment. Can remove it enchantment and, some, and yeah. some can't. That's true. That's interesting. Okay, let's go on to the next one here. It is a land... It is Plaza of Heroes. It's got a lot of activated abilities, so listen up. <laughs> yeah. The first one is you can just tap it to add colorless mana to your mana pool. The second one is you can tap it to add one mana of any color. Spend this mana only to cast a legendary spell. Mm-hmm. We know all decks have at least one of those. Uh, the third one is you can tap it to add one mana of any color among legendary permanents you control. And the final ability is pay three, tap and exile the Plaza of Heroes. Target legendary creature gains hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. So this is kind of a weird command tower comparison. It's just command tower with four times as many words. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's sort of. It, it's not as good as command tower no. sometimes, but it does have that ability at the end that command tower does not have. So mm-hmm. this is similar to you know Karn Silex or something. Not in power level, just in like there's a lot to kind of try and give some sort of quotient or value to, to kind of, does it all add up to a card that's good or not? Right. On its face, it is a land that will tap to help cast your commander or give you colorless mana. Mm-hmm. If you don't have a legendary, uh, is it permanent? Legendary permanent, permanent yeah. out. If you do because. have a leg- legendary permanent out, it will also add whatever colors that is. And if that is your commander, which presumably a lot of the time, the legendary permanent you have out is your commander, which is the colors of your deck, because mm-hmm. it has to be, then it just is a command tower that has an extra ability. Right. So it's if you control your commander, it's a command tower. And it helps you cast your commander on curve because it taps for for any color uh, to, to cast, cast, legendary. cast legendary permanence. And then it also protects your commander. Hard to evaluate. Seem. I mean, it seems good. Yeah. But but so here's my thing is we fixing is great right now. I think we've got all the, like, we got a ton of lands. We're not really worried about fixing as much as we used to be. It feels like um, you rarely build a deck and you're like, boy, how am I going to make sure that I have all my colors on time? Like, right. you, you just kind of are with triumphs and everything. It's just you, not that hard. Yeah. It's like, I don't I don't run fetch lands in all of my decks. I only run on color fetch lands in the ones that I do because I just, flavor wise, I don't love it. And the fixing's good enough to just do that. And you still so don't worry, yeah. I don't think you need it. And I only think you want it if, if you're like, you're you're in three colors at least, and your commander like you want to cast your commander on curve. I think that's where it's best. Where like I have a CDC Brood Tyrant deck, which is is one and then three colors, and I want to hit it on curve, and I want to make sure I have all my colors. I think it's good in something like that, where it's like, all right, I need I need my green, I need it to come in untapped, and I have to have CDC on curve, or this deck is like, is, is stumbles. It's interesting, though, because g- monocolored and dual color decks just have more room in them for uh, lands that are more utility than they right. are providing color. So sure. it would be fine maybe in those as well. Yeah. Because it can give you the color if you need it to cast your commander. And if your commander's out, it taps for color. But if it doesn't, it's, it's not, not really the worst good. because yeah. I only need one color or I only need two colors. Yeah. So I think there's arguments to be made on both sides. We're like, hey, if I'm five color, it's a land that's going to tap for a lot more than two mm-hmm. colors, sometimes all five of my colors. Yeah. And hey, if I'm one color... It's usually going to provide that one color for my commander, and then it has some added utility. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think I think it's just going to kind of be a card that we see. We're going to see lot. a lot of it, yeah. for sure. Because uh, I think in, in most cases, like 85 percent of the time, it'll be a great land for you to have that will give you exactly whatever you need. Yeah. And then, what about that last ability? How do you evaluate that? Uh, before we before we move yeah. on, I this this is a little weird in some decks. So if you have like a Kenrith deck, mm. this does not fix you. Uh, um, yeah, because yeah. Kenrith is white when he's on the battlefield. It's not color identity. It's not color identity. Yeah. So if you have, if you're playing like Yasova, which is which is green and has like a 
blue red activated ability or something the like last that oh uh, yeah yeah though like there's a, a number of commanders that uh their identity is different than what color they are so it could be a little weird in some decks yeah just... don't play it in your goto deck yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke because he's banned uh golos Golos, I said Goto. You said Goto. Oh, I was yeah. like, mm, it's you fine still in. don't play it. Uh, it's fine. Well, that's an interesting. Sorry, I meant Golos, yeah. but I said Goto. But it's an interesting question because it does kind of bring us to that last ability, which yes. is pay three, exile, tap and exile the plaza, mm-hmm. and target legendary creature gains hexproof and indestructible and until end of turn. How do you factor that in? Because those are things I sometimes want. Those are good things. Uh, it's very, very expensive. Four mana, basically. This, this is, you have to tap four lands yeah. to, to do this. Um, and and likely, you're not going to be able to do this the turn after you cast your commander. You, oh, you know, yeah, because yeah. like You if don't you, play it as protection right now. Right. It's, it's protection in the long game, which is a little strange. Like, my commanders that eat removal the fastest, like, like I have a Rakdos Lord of Riots deck. If I slam Rakdos on turn four... I, I they really, kill it right now. they really got to kill it right now. And I, it's not going to save me from that. Like if I untap with Rakdos, he's going to do his thing. It's, it's great. But it, it having four mana and holding up four mana to activate mm-hmm. this is not going to save me in the moments where I need to, it to save me the most. So some, maybe some sort of distinction needs to be made between commanders that sort of become scarier the longer they're out, like a Shies right. and things like that. Yes. This is probably a lot better in a deck like that than yeah. it is in a deck that's like, no, they're going to want like Selvala or something where it's like, they got to kill that as soon as it was right. played because they know. Something's coming. We're going to lose the next turn or right. very soon if they untap with that. That's interesting. So like, it's definitely, I think the utility spell is definitely going to come into play, but I, I think it's going to be best in like Voltron decks where something gets progressively bigger and scarier or in like long-term value decks or you're putting counters on it or something like that. I think uh, decks that just have a biggest. lot of instance. It will probably For be sure. good because you're just holding up your mana most of the time. Oh, so and much mana. If this up. is up with mana open, they will not target your thing. You will not have to activate it. Right. They know you're going to, so they have to look for a window of opportunity. So in general, like just being able to hold up that mana during people's turns will keep your commander safe without using the mana. Right. And then, you know, if Coast is clearer on the end set before your turn, then maybe you cast that draw spell or something like that. So Overall, I love types of those types of cards because you do tend to be able to abuse them without having to use them. Right. Abuse it without using it. Hey. <laughs> yeah. May, make them use it isn't really a thing in commander because you're like, I'm not spending a card for that it's card. It's tough. I want yeah. my card. It's tough. Um, overall, what about I think uh, this Orvar? Is, <laughs> uh, I don't think I run it in Orvar because I care about islands too much. Oh, see, I have a bunch of the uh, the locust lands or whatever, and the, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I have can. a lot of colorless lying around in general. Yeah, My, I'm too focused on Mystic Sanctuary. Like okay. I, I run a lot of islands. Yeah, I have a Mystic Sanctuary too, but I don't have the need for that many islands because I just copy my islands. Sure, yeah, sir. Yeah. I don't know. I might run Plaza in that deck because I'm holding my mana open, open a lot, all the time. and it's a way to protect Orvar. I, so I, I think this card is just free. Like if you've got one, it'll probably work. It'll probably be good in your put deck. it in your deck, and it'll just be put good. It yeah, in. it's better in commander focused strategies. It's better if you can hold the mana open. It's better if your commander isn't scary immediately. But where but on the tiers of lands free. is it? Right, like it's not better than a shock land, right? No, it's not better than a fetch land. So obviously not better than like old school duels and guys cradles and stuff. So now we're below shock. Is it better than like a battle bond? How many opponents you have land? Uh, I don't think so. Is it better than a triumph? Here's mine. Is it, is it better than exotic orchard? (sighs) It's pretty close to exotic orchard. It's pretty close to exotic orchard. Which is like you run exotic orchard. You run exotic orchard unless you're running like Boros. Yeah. yeah, I actually think it, maybe it's better than exotic orchard in the monocolored or dual colored deck. Yeah. Because, Exotic Orchard is not a lot of utility right, in those yeah. two decks. Yeah. yeah. But once you're at three colors, then Exotic Orchard becomes better. It's just great. Yeah. But Plaza of Heroes is probably about equal in a three-color deck. Yeah. Interesting. It's it's hard to evaluate. I, I think it's like... But we're, we're, we're mincing words here. In general, play it. It's good. If you've yeah. got one, play it. <laughs> it's good. It, right now, it's quite expensive. So oh, is it? I Yeah. Um, so, I here, so here's my thing. is uh, Unless it's really good, you don't need it. Okay. You're fine. How expensive is it? It was like 20 bucks last time. What? Left. I know. Okay. It's, it's not, not that good. I don't think it's worth $20. No. Yeah. We're, okay. I'd much rather have Triumphs. Yes. And just own Triumphs in yeah, general. Yeah, for I think. sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're in agreement there. Uh, the next one we might not be in agreement because it's a three mana rock and everybody oh. knows that I do not like three mana rocks. But this, this one different. maybe, yeah, yeah, we'll see. This um, is different. You want to uh, read it? Yeah, let's read it. Uh, it's Relic of Legends. It's a three mana artifact that says tap, add one mana of any color. It's a mana lip. It has a second ability. Uh, it says tap an untapped legendary creature you control, add one mana of any color. Okay. I do like 
tap abilities and untapping, and I'd like I Cryptolith was gonna Rite say, a it lot. It says colon. Yeah. <laughs> it's tap, tap a legendary creature you control, colon. It doesn't give them that ability, so that's not a summoning sickness so thing. It you doesn't, do it, it. yeah, yep. it, it doesn't matter if they have summoning sickness. It doesn't, you can do it multiple times. If you control two legendary creatures, you can make two mana with it. It, everybody kind of compares this to Honor Worn Shaku, which is a very close comparison as well, which is a three mana artifact that taps on its own to add only colorless mana mm-hmm. and says tap an untapped legendary permanent you control. Little different. And you can untap Honor Worn Sh- Shaku, mm-hmm. which means you could tap it again for colorless. Yeah. So it's different, of course, but, you know, f- serves similar roles. Yeah. I think the big difference is that it, it taps for colored mana. And if you're running a lot of legendaries. Just generally, colored mana is going to be significantly better than colorless. Like, I didn't run Honor One Shaku in Dihada because I had too many colors. Mm, it just did the colorless mana didn't do as much. I mean, I think Honor One Shaku is legendary permanent versus legendary creature, which that is too. a difference. A lot of Planeswalker decks will run Honor One Shaku because there's no utility to having a Planeswalker untapped or tapped, well. so you yeah. may as well get mana out of it. You can tap, you can tap like, equipment. There is also a subtle difference between uh, Relic and Honor One Shaku in... Tapping a legendary creature to have it produce mana is a mana ability, mm-hmm. whereas tapping a legendary permanent to untap the Honor Worn Shaku is not a mana ability, so you can respond to it. That's interesting. So, yeah, I don't know how that affects the evaluation. I mean, I think, honestly, Relic is going to be playable because it's better in many ways than Honor Worn Shaku, so I, I think we will see it. I think Relic is really interesting because, like, this is this is an untapped rock that can tap for two mana the turn it comes down most of the time. Because you, like, if you're controlling your commander or if you have, like, Right, even... and you don't care if you're attacking with your commander or tapping it for something else. Right. Like, I would run a three mana rock that tapped for two mana of any color. Like, that's, that's very strong. And... If you have two legendaries, like if you have partner commanders, Oof. or if you have cheap commanders, if right. you have Rogue Rock as a commander, yep. this this card is, becomes extremely powerful. If you can tap two legendary creatures with this, it's free. Yeah, I mean, if you have 20 plus legendary creatures in your deck, I think you just run this because it's basically Cryptolith, right? Yeah. That oh, taps yeah. for mana, and Cryptolith right doesn't tap for mana, right? And yeah, we still... and Cryptolith right gives them the ability, so they need to not be summoning sick. Yeah, so this is better, better. than that in many ways. One yeah. one mana extra, but yeah. provides that mana, gives it back to you. So yeah. it kind of is the same as Cryptolith right as far as cost. Um, yeah, I agree. If you have a lot of legendary creatures, it's a no brainer. Of course, it's yeah. great in legendary decks. It taps for color, like it's it's also it's going to add synergy if you have a commander that wants to be tapped but doesn't want to attack, so like an Amara or a uh, like a King King Macar. Yep. Uh, Magda. Magda. Oh my insane god. Magda's Magda. already so good, but this is. Oh my god! Wait, it's so good at Magda. <laughs> I love that. Um, Just low CMC commanders that do not also want to attack or become tapped. So like Dina, uh, yeah. it's really good in Keenan Bond. I was going to say Keenan seems really yeah. really gross. Rogue Rock, as you said, because Rogue Rock often you can cast him, but he can't do much for a little while till you get some things on him or do some stuff. Right. So using him for mana until then seems like a great. And most of the time you're not blocking with your commander, right? Like it's. It doesn't matter if they're untapped or or tapped a lot of the time unless they have an attack trigger, of right. course. Um, I really like this deck in in commander in commander decks with partner. Just because you have two mana dorks. Because now. you have two right there. Yeah. Like if you're like if you're in Timnus Rassios, this thing taps for three. Most, it, who it's going it? into my yeah Thrasios Vile Smasher deck for sure. It's wild. Yeah. Um, because and I think it most of the time this can tap for two mana a turn, which is which is very powerful. Obviously, there's some decks that it doesn't come down into, but I think this card is going to be worth a closer look, especially if your commander is always on board and it doesn't have an attack trigger. Yeah, if it's three CMC or less for your commander. For sure, yeah. Although it gets a little awkward at three because you're probably playing on the You're fighting turn, a little but bit. because the next turn, you just basically play this for one mana. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I like it. I think it is a playable three mana rock. It's probably the top three mana rock that exists for me. Because now. it Coalition taps for more Relic than one mana. Warm- Power Stone, probably the next two. I think Coalition Relic is a very close comparison because it taps for one sometimes, it taps for two other times. But you have to save up, so it really only taps for one per turn, but you're kind of tricking it to and tap co- for two. And, yeah. the- and Coalition Relic doesn't tap for two the, man- the turn it comes down. Right, it only taps for one. Yeah. And where Power Stone taps for two every turn except for the turn it comes down, I think is a little underrated. Mm. But then again, I just don't play any three mana rocks. Maybe I'll play this one, though. But Warren Power Stone comes in tapped. Right. That's this what one, I mean. Yeah, this except one, for two every turn, yeah, except for the first. Except for the first one. Yeah. So it like it gives you the mana it gives you the mana back right away and it doesn't feel like I think the three it feels like a, a three is a big stumbling block because you it doesn't give you any mana back. All right, let's move on to the next one, which is a cool card, but there are some uh there's been a little snafu with this one. It's a, mm-hmm. All right, it's Sarah Paragon, two white white for a three four flying angel. Once during each of your turns you may cast 
sorry, you may play a land card from your graveyard or cast a permanent spell with mana value three or less from your graveyard. If you do, it gains when this permanent is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, exile it, and you gain two life. All right, let's talk about the rules, Snafu. First, the way they've worded this evidently, and as I read it, I don't see it, but judges have been discussing this. Um, it gives the spell the exile clause if it would leave the battlefield and not the permanent. Yeah, it says when you play, when you do, it gains. When you play, when you cast. Oh, right. Yeah. Not when it enters the battlefield. Right, yeah. So it's giving the spell, which means when it resolves into the permanent, it's it would gone. no longer have this little clause uh, that when it's put into a graveyard from the battlefield, exile it, and you gain two life. It's been pretty much universally accepted, even by the judges, that they are going to use this card as it was meant to be used. So regardless of the wording, and they'll probably oracle it or whatever they got to mm. do to make this work, um, it will effectively mean whatever land you either play or spell you cast from your graveyard will get the clause when it's on the battlefield of when it goes to the graveyard, exile it, gain two life. Notably, you can't just keep using the same fetch land over and over again for free. It's, it's yeah. I mean, you can only do it once per turn. So yeah. Yeah. But, but like every turn. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that out of the way, we're going to evaluate it as it is meant to be played and not how it is worded for the rules experts out there. All right. Yeah. So this is a ramming up excavator crucible of worlds at its baseline. And a Moldrow at the top. Yeah. It's awesome. I love this card. I'm obsessed with Sarah Paragon. Um, what I like about this one is it's has a sun Titan like effect without being six mana and without being completely terrifying. Right. Because Sun Titan has a lot of like just cool utility where you're like, I get in a land brack. It's like a cute ramp thing. And, but it's so scary that you get to use it like maybe once. And it's <laughs> and, six mana. And so, it's six mana. Yeah. It's slow. So Sarah Paragon gets you like draw, gets you some card selection, gets you some recursion. And it doesn't feel like the kind of card that you're like, I have to remove this immediately or the value is going to be out of control. Yeah, because it, it is capped at only once on each of your turns too. So yeah. it's going to give you value, but it's hard for you to just like combo off with it. Right. So which I think is important for just how scary it is to players and therefore how much they'll let you sort of keep it. Right. I like I love playing cards that fly a little bit under the radar where they're like, that's going to be scary, but it's not scary right now. Right. Uh, and I think this card is in is a like perfectly in the pocket of like, you know, you have to do something about it eventually, but it doesn't feel great to remove it because you're like, oh, they have is a Cathar Commando. And you're like... Well, and you can know. play it in a manner where even if they remove it right away, you kind of did get something out of it. So I imagine you're playing right. this most of the time before you play your land drop for whatever turn it is. Yes. You play it, you immediately get a land out of your graveyard, put that into play, mm -hmm. uh, and now you've gotten a card's worth of value back. And like, listen, you don't want them to remove it at that point, but if they remove it, you didn't get nothing for it. Right. You know, you got something. And that feels pretty bad when I use my removal spell and they didn't lose a card, right. even though they got a land out of it. And it's I think drew a card. Yeah. So, so fetch lands, cycle lands, everything. If you've already got those in your deck, and I already play those in most of my white decks because of Savine's Reclamation and things like that. Yeah, for sure. And you know, just card advantage in white—that's one way to get them. I even run Ash Barons in a lot of my white decks. Yes. Yeah. Because it's because it's untapped and it goes to the yard and it gets a gets a land out of your deck. Um, so many ways to get it back in white these days. Yeah, for and sure. You can ramp in that way too. This isn't ramp, right? Because it's still taking your land drop for the turn. But yeah, it's yeah. card selection um, and recursion, which is which is really cool. Um, Let's talk about some other three CMC or less stuff you get that isn't just lands. Um, Sagas, you mentioned. I love that. They like to go to the graveyard. Yeah, the new uh, Restoration of Iganjo is really, really good. And I believe it blinks itself out, so it loses the clause and then returns. Oh, uh, yeah. We'll talk about that in a minute, how to avoid the exile clause. There yeah. are many ways to do it, but that thing does it on its own. Yeah, super cool. Then there's just a bunch of cards in white that's just kind of, they send themselves to the graveyard for some sort of utility ability. Selfless Spirit, Remorseful Cleric, Cathar Commando. Commando. Yeah, that's all going to be really good with Sarah Paragon, because imagine like, hey, I just make stuff indestructible every turn now if I want to. Yeah, yeah. I mean... These those little utility creatures that sack for there's a lot that sack to get something indestructible or protection from a color until end of turn. There's a lot of u little utility creatures that I I can see being super valuable with this era paragon. Uh, it's gonna be real annoying with merciless executioner, fleshbag marauder type Gross, stuff. Yep. Just play all that stuff twice. That seems like not 
going to be a lot. It's going to be a slog to get through. Mm-hmm. Scrap trawler and things like that. You're already in the artifacto crats thing with mirror yep. retrievers and stuff like that. You got to worry about the exile clause a little bit, but just getting your mirror retriever back a second time for kind of that's free. A, that's a ton of value yeah. still. Um, yeah, I, it's terrifying with Dockside Extortionist. Oh, um, boy. Because yeah. even two, like two Dockside's is you win the game. Yeah. Right? There's yeah. no way. And you could cast it off of the mana you got from the first one. So. If you have a sack outlay, you're just two Dockside's in one turn. That's a Dockside problem more than a it's yeah, it problem, is. but yeah. It is. Okay, um, let's talk about, because I think for Dockside, for Scrap Trawler, for some of these things, like you're thinking, well, I don't want it to get exiled, so mm-hmm. maybe I don't want to play it with Sarah Paragon, but there's a bunch of ways to sort of avoid the exile uh, clause or get rid of it. So if you blink the creature after you've cast it out of your graveyard with Sarah Peregrine, it will come back in and it, now it won't have that like, hey, if it dies, exile it clause mm-hmm. or if it would go to the graveyard. If it would go to the graveyard. And right. white, fortunately, is one of the creatures or colors that is best at blinking things. Right. You've got a uh, Ephemerate and Teleportation Circle, Conjurer's Closet, Sword of Hearth and Home is really good in this kind of deck. There's an interesting interaction. I think this is one Truck came up with, with Flash creatures because of the way that Sarah Paragon's uh, that, that exile clause is worded. So it says, when this permanent is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, exile it and gain two life. So this is not a replacement effect. This is a triggered effect when it hits the graveyard. So if you have a white flash creature that is three CDMC or less, you can respond to that trigger by casting the card. Interesting. So even Mind Sensor, uh, Deep Gnome Terramancer. Have you played with this card? Holy oh crap, that card. Oh my God, this card ridiculous. is crazy. That's a card people want to kill. Well, uh, it, Cathar Commando. Cathar Commando. Oh, yep. So you can flash them back in in response to that exile thing. Interesting. And just kind of, as long as it's your turn, obviously, and you haven't already activated or used your once per turn thing, you can do that. So That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. It, I would not have thought about that. So, uh, yeah, if you uh, if somebody goes to kill your Deep Gnome Terramancer or something like that, the trigger will go on the stack and you have an opportunity to respond to it is is what that means. But it has to be during your turn because you can only use Sarah Paragon's ability once during each of your turns. Your turn. So this should just tell you if you've got to kill a Deep Gnome Terramancer and uh, Sarah Paragon's out, do it on your turn. Yeah. Or somebody else's. But not the person, not the the player who owns the Deep Terra. That's really cool. I really like Sarah Paragon. Yeah. All right, uh, next next one. Next one's crazy. It's Silverback Elder for two green, 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 three greens. You, whenever you cast a creature spell, choose one. Oh, this is a five seven ape shaman. It's a five mana five seven naturally. But it says, whenever you cast a creature spell, choose one. Destroy target artifact or enchantment, or look at the top five cards of your library. You may put a land card from among them onto the battlefield tapped, but the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order, or you gain four life. I feel like that last one's going to be used the least. But hey, listen, that will come up once in a while. It, it will absolutely come up once in a while. Um yeah, this this card's insane. This card's extremely powerful, and a lot what people like love in commander decks, I think. Yeah, it's kind of like an aura shards mm-hmm. mixed with, you know, a, a mini ramp spell. Yeah, whenever you cast a creature, you ramp sometimes. Yeah. Is very I good. I think most of the Most of the time. Prob- top five? Uh, top, top five. five cards. That's a you lot of all, cards. Yeah, I don't know what the percentage is, but almost always you In green, get you're lands. 40% lands yeah. most of the time. So, yeah, that's very good chances to hit. I think the comparisons to this card to sort of see if it's good and I... I was a little broad in the comparisons, but it's because we know like four CMC, what I'll call force multiplier cards are playable and we see them a lot. So yeah. I would put in that category like Beast Whisperer, yep. which is Guardian the closest Project. comp to this. Yeah. Guardian Project. Uh, even like Panharmonicon. These right. are cards you play them. They really don't do much on their own, but they're going to just force multiply the plays you make from then on for the rest of the game. Right. Like a five CMC one, like doubling season, is a five CMC one that has a powerful impact on the game, but doesn't do anything the moment it comes right. down. Two lane, I would put in that same category. Yeah. Uh, Kindred Discovery. Absolutely. Most of the Defilers are that, right? Because they're five CMC. Yeah, they're not good until you have another spell. Yeah. Sigil of the Empty Throne is a similar type thing. There's a bunch right. of token maker ones that just say, like, once this is Whenever out, you every spell you're going to play, you're going to make tokens. Yeah. Metallurgic Summoning is is a great example. God Eternal, Oketra, a lot of these see play. Even at 6 CMC, this effect is still pretty common, right? A Zendikar Resurgent, Tidespout Tyrant, Holebreaker Horror. Uh, yeah, those are higher even. Some of those are more than 6 CMC, six, and seven, we still yeah. see them get played where it's like, I play this card, but on its own doesn't do much. It's just going to make my subsequent plays more powerful. So I think that tells us Silverback Elder at 5 CMC is more than playable. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and so now it's just going to fill the role of Aura Shards, kind of. 
You, yeah. Yeah, you need probably 20 creatures, 25 creatures before sure. it's good, but that's a very low bar to clear. You also need to be largely green. It does have three green pips, but you're in green. Your fixing's fine. Yeah. Um, I yep. think... I think the big thing about this one that's worth noting is it is a cast trigger, not an ETB trigger. Oh, yeah. um, like Guardian Project is an ETB trigger, so it's a, it's a little different. You can't just like reanimate. You have to actually cast. But Can't blink. The fact that you have options is so wild. And it makes me like it more than Aura Shards because Aura Shards is like, oops, I accidentally blew up all of my opponent's stuff forever. And this is like a little bit more specialized, a little bit more targeted. Um I mean, but Aura Shards is 3 CMC, so it just comes that, out so much earlier. That is that yeah. is true. It's not better than Aura Shards, but I think it's it's certainly kinder. <laughs> I think and it's, it's going to trick people into thinking it's kinder, but I'm just going to yeah. say, like, well, every time you blow up one of my artifacts or enchantments, you could have chosen a ramp, so that's it's true. actually meaner. That, yeah. That's true. You, 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 you could have gained life. on purpose. Yeah, you had three choices, and you chose the one that destroyed you my thing. You hurt me. <laughs> um, this is interesting. Uh, if this comes down... I'm pretty terrified immediately, oh, right? Yeah. Like oh, yeah. I, Just like I, horror shards. I don't think you cast this and then pass. I think you're going to want this and a Sakura Tribelder or this and a Elvish Mystic or something if you're casting a Silverback Elder, right? Yeah. I don't know. It's tough. Five mana is a lot. Five mana is a lot? So what are you going to do? If you suddenly make it virtually cost seven mana, I don't think it's that good. That's true. Now it's Zendikar Resurgent. That's so true. So I think you have to be willing to run it out there and hope there are other scarier things out there. But it's That's true. at this level level of like at a five CMC, I think it's just really about what's on the board, whether you can do that or not. For sure. Like if there's something that just has to be destroyed, then save it and wait. If it's just generally stuff mm -hmm. out there and it would be hard for anybody to say like, there's one thing out there that's definitely getting killed, then you're right. safer to play it because everybody can kind of talk themselves into like, well, they'll probably get that thing over there. Right, that's true. Yeah. So it's, do you think this is a staple? Do you, do you think this is like going to go in most green decks? Yeah. Yeah, I like think, Beast Whisperer I, level. I, I don't think it's Beast Whisperer level, but I do think like this is exactly the kind of effect that commander players love and this is exactly the kind of effect that people are going like it's very easy to put this in a deck yeah you won't have to change your deck at all you'll just have no. to be like do i have creatures in it okay cool no. it's going in there and like you know you pop out i don't know even even like a croson grip it feels sort of wimpy and like one card for one card compared to compared to something like this yeah which could potentially be more and is easy to recur how much of a downside is the three green pips you're in green. Your fixing is, is going to be quite strong, largely. I wouldn't rush this into into a three-color deck, but it, your man, land fixing is already going to be pretty strong, so I don't think it's going to be that big of a deal. Um, of all the colors, green is the one that can kind of make sure that if you see it in your opening hand, you can steer towards yeah. that. Whereas if you're not, if you're in Boris or something, you just kind of get what lands you've got. The one thing about this is this isn't this isn't a win the game card. This is a value card, and it is expensive for a value card. So five is near the top end, but like we said, we see some other cards that we, are fit that mold and are more expensive. Absolutely, and like a Vanquisher's Banner even it yeah. feels feels comparable to this. So. Um, it's going to see a lot of play. I certainly have a deck that it's going to go right into. Um, I think we're going to we're going to see a lot of this monkey. This monkey. Monkey. All right. The next one is temporary lockdown. This is one white white for an enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, exile each non-land permanent with mana value two or less until temporary lockdown leaves the battlefield. I've been asking for more cards like this. This is sweet. I love this card. Yeah, I think you know. Everyone always gets on me because I say things like I don't like three mana rocks and I pretty much only play two mana rocks mm -hmm. now and they think that that is me advocating for a certain style of play when it is not. It is me play adjusting my play style to the rising inflation of the format. I, I like it better when it was a little bit slower. Sure. It doesn't matter because the other players won't let me play at that speed anymore. So I'm sort of forced to just play with the cards that exist, right? Yeah. If there were more cards like Temporary Lockdown, I think we would have to see deck building change a little bit. If you could punish sure. low CMC stuff where there was enough cards that said, hey, if you're going to go all in on really low, fast stuff, you can get hosed by a multitude of you cards. Can really get blown out. Yeah. Well, and there's this one and there's the green black one now. Yeah. The, uh, that destroys all things to CMC or less. Yeah. That's that much green black the, mana. It's really, really powerful. <laughs> Coley, nope. Culling Ritual. Culling Ritual. Got there. Yep. Uh, so we are starting to see a little bit more of this. And it is definitely punishing to people who are like, you know what? My my deck is full of every talisman and every signet and every like mana crypt and mana uh, soul ring and 
Um, yeah, I would love if the, there's not enough, right? There's two is not enough. There has two is to not be, enough. There has to be sure. enough that you're likely to run into it into in a game where it would change your deck building. But this is a start, and I, mm-hmm. I hope they keep going in this direction and give this tool to a few colors, not yeah. just you know. Well, and right now we've seen in three, so that's nice. And I think red yeah. could have a you know blow up all artifacts two CMC or less card very easily, like that's a cool. mini Vandal Blast. It has to cost you know three or less because. Otherwise, once you get up too high mana cost by turn five, if they're already low to the ground and fast with stuff that you have right. to worry about this two CMC, it's too late to stop it at that point. This is a big tempo play. Yeah, um, it's it's fine late in the game, like a, like every once in a while it'll hit all of the tokens or it'll it'll clean up a board. But I think this card is going to be best on turn like four. Once everybody's like trying to set up and you're like, all right, I've got six mana and you're like, actually you have three. Um, and it it really punishes people who keep soul ring hands with like two lands. Yeah. Which but I that, love. You should get punished for I, that. <laughs> like I love a broken bond that comes down, gives you an extra land drop and nugs a soul ring or a, a signet. It's a huge tempo play and slowing down the game and recognizing that you're like, I'm in white. I have a grindy deck. I can live in the fat long game. But if if this deck pops up, gets out from under me, I can't. So I it's, think too, it's this huge. is still going to be good if you draw it on turn six or seven because yeah. a lot of cards are still hanging around that are useful to players. Yeah, I mean we've all had a Vandal Blast hit us like turn seven or eight. Yeah, and you just look down and you're like, wait a minute, I didn't really think about it. But now I've only got four mana and all my opponents have seven yeah. because they have more lands. I missed a couple land drops, but I was making up for it with mana rocks and things like that. So I think yeah. it, it's still useful. It's going to clean up, like you said, mana rocks. Mana Dorks. Mm. There's Lightning Greaves and Swiftfoot Boots. Everywhere. Esper Sentinels and Mystic Remora, Sylvan Libraries. All There's of, a yeah. lot of stuff that hit that it hits that's still good late in the game. So I really like that about it. Okay, I got another uh, pop quiz question yes. for you here. I love right. it. Of the top 100 most played commander cards, according to EDH Rec, how many do you think are permanents that are two mana value or Ooh. less? Of the top 100? Yeah. It feels like a lot. Uh, like 45. All right, it's 32. Okay. Was it? Okay. Well, it's of the top. Remember, it has to be permanent cards. Permanent cards, right. right. Yeah, yeah. The permanent, like, automatically Should have done the out. math. Yeah. Should have added up from the last ones. <laughs> I could have done this. I think I could have. Give me a second. <laughs> but still, I'd say 32 is fairly high. It's going to hit a third of all the top 100 most played cards, period. Right. Um, again, some of those are like Secure Traveler, which you don't care about. But um, And then of the top 100 commanders, this surprised me. Yeah. Top 100 commanders uh, on EDA Trek, how many do you think are two mana value or less? Uh, a top 100? I don't know, like 15? It's very low. It it's feels actually quite six. Low. Six, yeah, yeah. There just aren't that many two CMC or less commanders in the top 100 most popular on EDA Trek. And For again, sure. this is according yeah. to EDA Trek, so yeah. take it with a grain of salt. Um, so it actually, like, kind of in a weird way, Hits less stuff than Cutdown does, and it also does. in That's a weird true. way, I am more likely to play this card than Cutdown. <laughs> I, I know what kind of deck wants this, yeah, because I have it. Where it's like I have a, a mono white good stuff Mangara deck that's like I'm here to play my lands every turn, and I'm going to kill you with an Avacyn. And it's like in that deck, I th- I think that's really where it wants to live, and you can keep recurring it, and it keeps, you know, sort of it sort of keeps a boot on the neck of decks that are trying to be explosive. When you're like, no, I'm here to I'm here to out grind you. Where cut down's a little bit more like, hopefully they've done something mean, and I have an answer. Right, right. <laughs> hopefully they're playing something broken. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's go on to the next oh, one here. I'm also excited about it because I have a deck with Karuga as a companion. Oh, yeah. It's uh, great in a deck like that because, I yeah, you it. already know your CMC is just high. Nothing. Yeah. I got nothing for that. Uh, it also gets rid of all, like, treasure tokens. So if people are, like, it's, like, use them, use them or lose them moment, which is Yeah, anybody cool. who's stocking up on clues and treasures and food. Yeah, I think it's cool. Get rid of them. Yeah, that's nice. All right. You want to talk about threats undetected? Yeah. So this is a new one. It's a... Uh, green sorcery for two and a green that says search your library for up to four creature cards with different powers and re- with different powers and reveal them. An opponent chooses two of those cards, shuffle the chosen cards into your library and put the rest into your hand. So it's in the un cycle, like gifts ungiven and mm-hmm. realms uncharted. Yep. Uh, there's sort of two important differences to note. Gifts Ungiven and Realms Uncharted don't have a restriction on the type of cards you find as far as like, no. yeah. They this also is, go to the graveyard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was the second part. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> the first one is that you have to f- search for creatures and the creatures have to be different powers. Right. The power and toughness thing matters a little for like what combos you can go get. And I think like yeah. 
the first thing you think of when you see a card that tutors for four cards is like what combos can i put together yeah absolutely uh there's a bunch probably one we found is like if you combine this with creature tutors so creatures that tutor creatures Mm -hmm. then you're really getting into combo territory so if you get imperial recruiter uh, Rocco Cabaret Caterer is another one. These are cards that can go find other creatures. So you kind of put them in this no-win situation where it's like, listen, if you give me this creature, okay. then it will find the creature I want. If mm-hmm. you don't give me it, you're giving me one of the other ones, which are the creatures I want. Yes. Um, so if you paired those two with like Kiki Jiki and Coercive Recruiter, then all of a sudden you'd put them in a no-win situation where they're like, okay, no matter what I give you, you will assemble the Kiki Jiki combo. Right. You can't do Zealous Conscripts because different powers and toughness is or whatever. Um, Which is usually the case with tutors like this. Like normally there's a stack of four cards where it's like, I'm going to get what I want. Yeah, I'm going to so, I'm gonna combo, right? Like, right. I'm going to get the stack of four cards. Whatever you give me, mm-hmm. I will have the win available to me now and I just have to get it, I have to cast it. Right, yeah. Um, so that's not that interesting to talk about, and maybe we we probably didn't even find the best one. So I'm sh- I'm sure there's some everybody. some yeah. insane stack of four creatures that will put together a win with this. Not- notably, they they don't go to their graveyard, so that you do have to like be able to find the other stuff. Whoops, sorry. So that you can't just put together like a reanimation stack uh, uh, or the, something like the that. The one thing too is with these tutor- creature tutors, even if they don't tutor for other creatures, you can find creatures that tutor for stuff, and then you can kind of tutor for anything, right? So if you put a right. Stoneforge Mystic in there and a Sedisi Undead Vizier in there, mm. you know, Recruiter of the Guard gets creatures. But, like, there are creatures that will tutor for all card types. Right, yeah, of course. And they don't always know what it is the heck that you want to do. Right. So if you just, like, here, if I just handed you a pile, and I'm like, Stoneforge Mystic, Sedisi, whatever it is, if I just hand those to you, like, how do you even know what to give me? Because, like, yeah, you don't know what I want. I give you the most expensive ones yeah. is, is usually the answer and hope that was right. Or at least it'll be slower. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, I don't know what's happening, Whatever but it'll it be slowest. At least at least you're going to have to tap some lands. I don't know. Good luck. <laughs> is this card playable or good as just a value card, do you think? Like, I'm not putting in my deck to try and assemble a combo. I'm just going to get the third and fourth best creature in my deck. So this is, is a three mana sorcery that says draw two creatures that you are pretty good right now. Which feels pretty good, right? Right? Like if they've, it's a divination that can't miss. Yeah, it like can't this, get lands. This feels better than harmonize for sure. I would rather have two cards that are pretty good than three whichever right three card. cards, and it's one mana cheaper than that. So I think as a value play, it's honestly better than as a combo card. I think it's like because it, even if you're finding like these combo pieces where you're like, okay, I get a recruiter and I search for another thing and I have to search for that, and you probably have it, but it's going to be a bit of a mess. I think if you're looking at this as like, okay, I'm going to go search for, I'm going to go find a reclamation stage and I know they're going to give it to me because we have to handle this rustic study. It's going to be good as like that kind of tutor yeah. and you get a bonus one that you can kind of like politic in. It's like, okay, I'll take care of this, but you have to give me this. I also think like just if you got your third and fourth best creature out of it. It's pretty good. I mean, you don't have any of the top four in your hand right now, I'd rather have the third and fourth. And that's yeah. giving your opponents a lot of credit being able to identify what right. the third and fourth best are. I bet a lot of times you'd get the second and third best or whatever. Yeah. Probably the best one they'll know. But just, yeah, I like what you said there about Reclamation Sage and sort of finding answers to stuff too. There will be somebody at the table who is like incentivized to help you a little bit. Right. Yeah. Um, for sure. It, and if it's, a, if it's a combo deck, I honestly think it's a worse tutor than just Eladomery's Call or like Worldly Tutor, where you're like, I need one, I'm going to get the one. But if you're like, you know what, I have a deck full of creatures and a deck full of creature-based answers, it's great. I think it's cool. All right. We're almost there. we got two more cards left. And this is for us. Yeah. Uh, this is a, a new, shi- a shiny new toy for Orvar. It's Vesuvan Duplomanc- Duplomancy. Not Diplomacy. Duplomancy. Right. Somebody like, got real cl- clever. Yeah. But it's hard to say out loud, yeah. Man, I, I don't know if I've ever read this out loud. I just assumed it was diplomacy. <laughs> Vesuvian diplomacy. Like, like three. duplicate, not diplo- <laughs> diplomat. Okay. Uh, for, it is an enchantment for three and a blue. It says, whenever you cast a spell that targets only a single artifact or creature you control, create a token that's a copy of that artifact or creature, except it's not legendary. So it's a Orvar-ish. Yeah, it's an Orvar-ish card. It definitely reminds, I'm sure, both of us is or, of Orvar. Mm-hmm. 
couple differences. One is it makes non-legendary copies. Very cool. So that matters for sure. Yep. In fact, if you put this in the Orvar deck, you can make multiple Orvars. That's scary. Gross. Have done that with Sakashimas in the past, so, and that yeah. gets out of control so fast. You play this, you copy Orvar, then you copy this with an Orvar, and then you then copy you're doing all a lot the Orvars. And the everybody Orvars. else goes to lunch because yeah. you're you're doing math. <laughs> yeah. You're doing some duplomancy. Uh, it does tr- trigger off any spell as well, which Orvar doesn't do. So this opens up Auras. Auras, yep, which is, certainly. Which could be big. I, I, it's hard because it's not a legendary creature, so you wouldn't like put a bunch of Auras in the Orvar deck. But mm-hmm. if you had a deck like your um, significant others who has mm-hmm. an Aura-based like, blue deck, yep, well, all really of a sudden, cool. this probably just fits right in because the deck's already doing what this card wants to be done. Right. Um, and also Mutate. So. I was going to say, Mutate is sweet. Yeah. So you can start making some like multiple piles. That's It's going to get really weird. And please have some of those tokens that are like uh, infinite dry tokens. erase ones. Yeah, yeah. because it's going to get out of control. But yeah, this is the thing that Orvar can't do. It doesn't interact with Mutate. This does. Yes. Um, it has to be the target spell. Yeah, it has to target a single thing. So it... it like if it hits two things, it's not it's not going to work. But I love that it's non legendary because you can really make a mess with this. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, and it's yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool with blink spells. Ugh, I how love many it. how many cards that target a single thing do you think you need in your deck in order to play this? Like obviously Orvar already is built to take advantage of this. So right, yes, yeah. so what? But how many other decks out there exist? I know the new Ivy. Is going to be it's a gonna deck be great that's going to want something like this. I just don't know if there's a lot of decks, you know, Zada, yeah, but it's like, but it's in but red. It's in red. Yeah. It, it, combo combat uh, tricky decks or in blue is a little weird. So like if this if this was in green or red, I could see it much more based in in like combat tricks because there are decks that do that. Yeah. Um. So it's going to be a little funky. But I I think you do need like in the twenty five and thirty zone because otherwise this card is just dead 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 and you just would rather have a clone yeah right? that's a really good point like if you don't trigger this at least twice clone was better for you and phantasmal yes. image was way better i really think you want to be able to have a good shot at triggering this three times in a game right before it's like okay i'm real happy with this card right yeah, yeah. it's um because it is it is four mana you definitely want to trigger it twice and you definitely want to trigger it when it comes down i think you want five so, yeah mana. cool card but probably limited usage gonna be narrow for sure All right, we're down to the last card here, and it is a bit of a story spoiler. Speaking of which, if you're uh, out there in audience land and you didn't check out our... We we did a story summary of the whole Dominator United storyline. Yeah, we worked with um, Aaron from Game Grumps, Aaron Hansen, Jacob from Cobra Kai, Voxy, and then uh, we did a couple of video episodes on our channel. So there's five chapters of the Dominator United storyline, and what we did is we had everybody pretend they're Karn, but Karn streaming an old school like Final Fantasy Chrono Trigger RPG. And the it's RPG follows the storyline of Dominator United. We'll put a link in the show notes for this episode to chapter one, which is Jimmy playing if you haven't seen it. But um, yeah, you should check them all out. And you can follow along the path. They each link to the next one and sort yeah. of get the whole story. I By the end of it, I was just like, man, I wish this game, we called the game that they're playing Karn Quest. Which is great. <laughs> uh, I was like, I wish Karn Quest existed. It looks so fun to play. It's really fun. And it's a, it's a really great way to to go through the journey without uh, without doing all the reading yourself. Yeah, um, and it, without cool. us just saying, like, here's what happened in sort of right, a, a yeah. visual a way. Summary, yeah, yeah. yeah, It's very fun. Uh, I, I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, but, yeah, spoiler alert, uh, this card is called Weatherlight Completed. So the Weatherlight got turned into a Phyrexian somehow. They completed a boat. A flying boat. How do you turn... Um, it's an artifact into an artifact. Yeah, I'm not sure. All right, it's two mana for a 5-5 five, five flying legendary artifact vehicle. As long as Weatherlight... Is this the first vehicle that doesn't have crew, by the way? No. Oh, okay. Well, I thought it, I thought Maybe? it would be clever. I don't know the answer to that question. I was putting it out there rhetorically. As long as Weatherlight Completed has four or more Phoresis counters on it, it's a Phyrexian creature in addition to its other types. So it needs at least four counters to become a creature. Whenever a creature you control dies, put a Phoresis counter on Weatherlight Completed, then draw a card if it has seven or more Phoresis counters on it, if it doesn't, scry one. So here's how it works. Two mana, put it out there. One of your creatures dies. It has zero counters on it, so all you're going to do is put a counter on it and scry one. The third time, the fourth time that happens, you'll still just scry one when the creature died, but now it's a creature because it's got four counters on it. It's a 5-5. Five, five, right? uh, yeah, 5-5 five, five flying. It's a bit of a chonker. Yeah. yeah. The seventh time a creature you control dies, it will get the seventh phoresis counter, and now you're drawing a card, and every time subsequently that a creature dies, you will draw a card. 
So it it has three stages. Yes. Yeah. It's sort of the scry stage, the now it's a flying five five, yeah. still mm-hmm. scrying, and then eventually it's a card drawing engine. When your creatures die. So in in a dedicated uh token or aristocrat build this card i think is extremely powerful it's two mana and it's colorless yeah it's the 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 cost to put it into your deck and to have it in your hand and to play it is so little it's two Mm -hmm. mana and it will just sit there and eventually accrue you value yeah yeah even if it just turned into the five five and gave you the scry yeah it's pretty good a two mana five five flyer that scryed you four times i think that would be worth playing for sure and it's in a deck that's dedicated to like kill you with blood artist, like they're gonna a lot of stuff is gonna die yeah. a lot, and we're and it's like four to turn it into a thing. Like honestly, I sort of wish it didn't turn into a creature. It's easier to remove, but um, getting I getting to seven just doesn't seem like that many to me. That was my big question because and I don't have an answer because there's no way to check this on EDH Trek. So this is not a pop quiz, but yes, I mean it kind of is, but I won't be able to say whether you're right or wrong. How hard is it? to get to four or seven counters on it, respectively, in a game. I have a tendency to believe that we sort of think more creatures die in your average commander game than yeah. do. And I think, I like what you said, tokens and aristocrats decks, especially aristocrats, are already focused on doing this. Right. So this goes in those decks, but you're probably not putting it in a deck and just hoping creatures die. You have to be sacrificing them. Definitely. Right? Yeah. I, I think this is a, is a very narrow card in terms of strategy, but it... The payoff is enormous. It's every time a creature, not non-token, not it's it's a, a creature you control. Of yep. course, it's not any time a creature that would be nuts. But um, <laughs> any time a creature you control dies, you could like you scry one is a lot of value. And then getting to the point where you're sacking creatures to draw cards is is an unbelievable amount of value um and i, mean, I you really want to get there because that's when you're probably going to win as an aristocrat deck because right, you're just going to draw sure. into whatever the next part to keep it going is. right the uh, a bigger payoff yeah. or a, a larger token uh, creator or something like that um so i i definitely like it in dedicated aristocrat builds in dedicated token builds i think it's going to be a little bit tougher because you you know the deck is designed to keep your tokens alive so you're just like it's backup in case there's a board wipe. I don't think it's going to be great in just a regular token build where your plan is to like make your tokens big and attack with all these creatures. Um, yeah, I sort of think that the way you determine whether you should play this card is by counting the number of sacrifice outlets that you have in your deck. And you sure. don't need 25. This yeah. is a different thing. But I think if your deck doesn't have, you know, seven or so six or seven ways to sacrifice creatures it's probably not focused enough on that strategy to make this card good right so if your deck does have six or seven sacrifice uh, effects in its deck then that probably tells you or more obviously right that like oh it's a candidate for a card like this because i have at least enough of a sub theme that i'm likely to get to four so mm-hmm. i don't think you have to get to seven but getting to seven would be amazing but it's easy to underrate the scry. But three it also scry, starts immediately. Yeah. Like yeah. the scrying starts right now. Three scry is, you know, it, by the old rubric we used to use, scrying three times is equal to a card. Right. Is equal to card draw. Mm-hmm. So, and a two mana five five flyer is worth, definitely worth a card in your deck. Absolutely. And one thing we always talk about around the office is just like we play a lot of commander games and every time, you know, very often there will be a game that's just kind of won by a couple of big flyers because absolutely flyers just kind of get there. It's just chunking you down for five per turn is quite a bit and tends to make a difference in the game. Absolutely. I mean, even even if you're just like, you know what, my deck doesn't have a lot of aggressive energy. A two mana five, five blocker is, is you're like, uh, that's enormous. That's huge. There's a boat in my way and it looks <laughs> so mad. <laughs> it's an angry boat. It's so upsetting. <laughs> I, I also like that it's sort of an early play that impacts the game in Aristocrats decks because I feel like Aristocrats don't, there's like one explosive turn, right? Well, they and, just basically make everybody sacrifice everything until they're ready to go. So you right. just can't keep creatures on the board. So it gives you it gives you something that you're like, all right, it's a little bit more defense that isn't just run out of gray pact and and uh, I hope that's enough. I mean, I think it's it, in some ways it might be problematic for an aristocrat deck in that, like you said, I don't think I want it to be a creature. Yeah, I would rather not be. So you're going to like maybe sit there at three and be like, how do I get to seven all in uh, once here? Absolutely. So yeah, that, that part of it might actually be uh, like a downside. Yeah, I, I definitely think that like you be careful about when you turn this into a boat if you can, because then obviously can it gets hit in board wipes and it's uh, there's a lot more targeted creature removal than targeted artifact removal, etc. 
All right. Well, Weatherlight starts with a W, which will tell you that we are at the end of the alphabetical list of cards we're going to talk about that go into your 99 for Dominaria United. Before we go, Rachel, mm -hmm. let's do the same thing we've done in the past, which is let's talk about what our favorite card is yeah. that we talked about today. Do you know what yours is? I... I think Sarah Paragon is the deck I'm most excited to have on board. It's very it's very on flavor for the kind of decks that I want to play. I like resilient decks, and I like a card that's powerful that isn't necessarily going to wave a big red flag in front of my opponent's faces. I think I'm going to say temporary lockdown, yeah. and it's mostly because I just like that they're designing in that space, and I want them to do that more because I think... Mm -hmm one of the hopes that our format has is that somehow we can slow it back down a little bit. And yeah. that seems like the best way to do it is to have enough of those cards running around that in deck brewing, people will start to hesitate about just putting two mana rocks. Like if I ever had to be like, I'm going to put a coalition relic and a uh, dark stealing it and God forbid a uh, chromatic lantern. <laughs> so that when, if somebody plays one of those cards, I don't get totally hosed and I'm yeah. still in the game. You're not just totally blown out. Yeah. That, that would be nice. Cause that's forced me to slow down my deck to to have a better chance to win, which I think would be a sort of good for the format. Over right, the long you're not term. putting all your eggs in the two CMC basket. Right now, there's is, just no downside nice to doing to do. it. Yeah, yeah. so I, I kind of have to. All right, what do you think is the most powerful card from the cards we talked about today? It's it's a little tricky because I I do think that power level wise. I, I think temporary lockdown is going to be very powerful in a lot of formats, or in 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 a lot of speeds. Yeah. Um, but. And I think Cutdown is very efficient and will be great in some tables, but I think we're going to see the most out of Silverback Elder. Yeah, that's a good one. I think Green Defiler's on that list. It's definitely close, yeah. Yeah, and I think Threats Undetected probably we'll see a lot. Yeah. I think people are just going to like that card and they are enamored of just like, I get cool stuff, whatever yeah. it is. So I'm not sure. Um, I think I'm going to say the Green Defiler. I think that's a good answer. Yeah. It's just yeah. going to put a lot of counters on stuff. It's going to... Every time they play that, you're going to be like, it, oh, it does that too? Yeah. It's really bad. Because <laughs> the plus one counters feel like an afterthought. And you're like, wait, how are your creatures six sixes? Yeah. And you're like, I don't know. I cast three mana dorks. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's sad a little bit is that we named four cards and three of them are green. Oh, yeah. A lot of good green cards coming out of this. As it turns out, a lot of good green, green cards all the time. Mm -hmm. All right. To the listeners... What do you think about all the cards in the 99? Is there a card from the set maybe that you think is going to make a splash in the format that we did not talk about? We'd love to hear from you in the comments on Twitter, email, Patreon comments, everything like that on Discord uh, if you're there. And let us know what uh, the cards are you're most excited about, what decks you have that they are going to go into. And then, of course, if you want to get your hands on these cards from Dominaria United, you need to go to channelfireball.com slash command. That is the best place to go to buy your Magic products, singles, anything at all. Your Magic players, you're going to buy Magic cards anyway. You may as well just use our affiliate link. When you do, you'll be supporting LGSs because, remember, all of the vendors on the Channel Fireball Marketplace are licensed businesses, and you'll also be supporting the content you enjoy, which is hopefully us because you've made it two and a half hours or whatever in this. I hope you're enjoying it. Uh, and then, of course... Once you get those cards, you want to protect them. Ultra Pro does make the best products to protect all of your game pieces. They are the company that Jimmy and I trust our own collections to. They have everything you need. If you need a play mat, they got it. If you need a deck box, they got it. If you need dice, they have really awesome Eclipse dice that I really, really like. Mm. If you need stuff to hang on your wall in your game room, they got wall scrolls and all kinds of other stuff. Ultrapro.com slash command is our affiliate link for their e-commerce website, which allows you to buy directly from Ultrapro. Also means they have all kinds of deals going on all the time. You can find crazy deals. I've, I've found 50% off some stuff just because it's a little bit older and they're looking to get rid of it. But if mm -hmm. it's like, hey, I, I have a deck that is built around that theme and now I can get it for this really low price yeah I'll, now I'll deck out my deck deck out my deck yes that's yeah. what I meant to say all right um, we're gonna skip the end step because this is a super long episode as all these set reviews always are Rachel thank you so much for coming and hanging out with Thanks us for having me yeah fun. where can everybody find you on the world wide webs if they're looking to check you out I am on Twitter and Instagram at Rachel Reeks it's my initials flipped pretty cool um, <laughs> I also have a commander podcast called Commander Sphere uh, it's real goofy real fun that's with my co-host Dan Sheehan. I also play live D&D &D every Monday at 7 p.m. Pacific. That's on Twitch, and that show's called Better Than Heroes. Highly recommend checking out Rachel's Twitter because she's always talking about the deck she's brewing. You yeah. like to keep everybody up to date on I sort do. of new cards and how you're changing decks and stuff. Yeah. I find it fun to follow you. I think thanks. you know, out there would as well. Um, and of course, big thanks to our amazing team here at the Command Zone, which is... 
Damon Lenz, Ashlyn Rose, Arthur Meadowcroft, Craig Blanchett, Lady Danger, Manson Lung, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Patrick Nan, Jordan Pridgen, Sam Waldo, Gaurav Galati, Sl- Jamie Block, Evan Limberger, and Mitch Trafford. And special thanks to Truck Ty for compiling all the stats and numbers for this episode. Whew, I can do it in one breath if I take a breath right beforehand. Uh, <laughs> shout out to Jeffrey Palmer as well, who does the living card animations that begin and end our show and does a lot of the windows behind us. He did do Thousand Year uh, Storm back here too. So you can find Jeffrey on Twitter at LivingCardsMTG. All right, everybody. We th- I think we have one more Dominaria United uh, review episode to go. Um, it is going to be the monocolored commanders and some of the uncommon commanders. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think you're going to probably be doing yeah. that. Jimmy, or maybe with me, we haven't decided everything yet. Uh, we're already starting to talk about 40K stuff, so there's a lot going on. Make sure Lots you hit coming the, out. Yeah, make sure that uh, you don't go anywhere. Hit the subscribe button, and we will see you very, very, very soon. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right, peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans.